this is totally unrelated to this video, but two things. One, I was in the middle of number two when I heard a knock on the door, it was a parcel. And then I was in the middle of brushing my teeth when my HelloFresh order came. So something's in the air today. Something is in the air today that's trying to prevent me from just living life. <laughs> I can't believe I just started off this video with me declaring that I was doing number two this morning. Anyway, hello, welcome or welcome back to How to Train Your Gavin. In today's video, I will be reading the entire Fishman Island saga arc, just arc, just the arc. I just put up my Return to Sabari arc video, which was only five chapters long. So it was a nice, short, quick and easy video. But we are hopefully gonna be back with some movie length One Piece videos today. I'm so excited about this arc because this is the first adventure the Straw Hats have been on after the time skip. And the first time I've seen them doing an adventure really since like Sabari Archipelago, Thriller Bark. I just can't bloody wait, I'm so excited. I mean, Return of Sabari was nice. It was a nice little transitional arc just to get our straw hats back together so that we can finally get to Fishman Island. How long have we been talking about this? We've been trying to get to Fishman Island for what feels like months. In fact, it probably has been in terms of when I've been reading each arc. It has been months. So <laughs> I just need us to finally get there. This arc is 51 chapters. It covers chapters 603 through to 653. So I have a nice sizable amount of volumes to read today. So it is between volume 61 and 66 of the English translated volumes. Nothing else to say really other than I do have a One Piece channel membership that's dedicated to all things One Piece. So if you want to check it out, there is a button down below that you can click on or click on the link in the description box. No worries if not, but please do like the video if you enjoyed and subscribe if you haven't already. Okay, let's just get into Fish Night. Firstly, I want to give a huge thank you to Deathly Muffins for making this entire pronunciation guide for me for the Return to Sabri arc and the Fishman Island arc. So thank you so much. And I'm gonna like I'm gonna follow it and I'm so grateful because they've also done like a couple of different like versions of like names. So like say Caribou or Caribou. I'll probably just go with Caribou because that was the first one on the video. But yeah, what the hell Caribou? He's just insane. Like, why does Murphy like him so much? Maybe it's because he's like a really interesting character. Like, I do like interesting characters. I do like villains, but he's just, he's freaking me out. And also he was gonna infiltrate the Straw Hat so that he can kill them from the inside. I think I'm more scared of this guy than I am of Blackbeard. Can you believe it? He does have some of the fake Straw Hats and they're pleading for their lives. And he has a devil fruit. I don't know what exactly it is that he does. Like, it looks like some kind of goo that he can sort of, like, that's his body. I don't know. I don't know. The sound effects are gloop gloop. So maybe it's like a gloop gloop fruit or something. It hasn't been revealed. It does say that he has a, a, a logia, a logia type devil fruit, but not what it actually is. But honestly, he's scaring me. He's scaring me, I don't like it. I mean, I love it, but I don't like it. I always knew as well that Kuma had sent them off to different places on purpose, but I'm just confused about Sanji. I, I don't understand. Like, I didn't mention anything in my previous video about what happened with Sanji and where he ended up because I don't really understand. And now he's getting these nosebleeds that looks like really, really bad whenever he says women. And I just, I, I don't, I don't understand. He says like a real live woman. What's happening with him? I, I have no idea. And I just don't know the context of it all. So I'm like very careful about not saying what I think about this whole Sanji situation. Cause I, I, I'm not hundred percent sure and I don't want to say the wrong thing, but that's really interesting to know. I, it's just, it's weird. It's just a little bit weird. But Kuma though, it was revealed that he had been protecting the Thousand Sunny all of this time. Frankie explains he had Dr. Vegapunk, the man who modified him, promised to program him one last mission to defend the ship until one of the straw hats returned. So like, I knew, I knew that Kuma would have sent them off in different places. That really meant a lot to them to progress and get stronger and learn things. So like Kuma, ugh, I feel even worse now knowing that he's now this like human weapon and he's been like taken over and stuff. And I'm just like, we need to save him now if we possibly can. I don't know if we can. So like we have stakes in the game with him and I didn't think we would before. I genuinely didn't think I would care that much about him, but I do, I do. I'm obsessed with seeing the Thousand Sunny underwater. This is true adventure. 
This is true adventure. It reminds me of Skypiea and going to the Sky Islands and how adventurous and magical that made me feel. I love the way that the ship, it shouldn't be under the water, you know, like it, it shouldn't, not unless it's sinking, but it's not sinking. It's being courted and it's on its way to Fishman Island. And like, this is normal. <laughs> it's just magical. They're surrounded by fish. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. I need to see this coloured in. And just seeing how small a Thousand Sunny is compared to, are these like the Neptunians and stuff? Either that or they're just like really big fish. But having the roots of the, like, Sabody Archipelago, having the roots going all the way down to the bottom, seeing how huge it is, it just gives you so much perspective in, like, this island and this world too. They are small fish compared to <laughs> the insane amount of largeness to this world. But yeah, like, this is the first adventure with them all together again. Uh, oh, I love it. Actually, hang on, hang on. One thing I learned, is this Roger, is in Gold Day Roger wearing a straw hat? What? So he had a straw hat first? I didn't know this. Is this common knowledge? What? So there's even more importance now to the straw hat than ever before. Just like the D. Like, what does the D stand for? Why is there a straw hat on Gold Day Roger? And why does, well, why did Shanks then have it? Did Gold Day Roger pass it down to Shanks? And then Shanks passed it down to Luffy? What? Like, oh, I'm just so, I, I'm confused in such a good way. Wow. I genuinely thought that was Luffy. I genuinely, but then I, he said, I'm Roger. And I'm just like, what? Is this like another person who's like imitating Luffy? Like the fake Luffy from the previous arc? But no, it's a flashback to Rayleigh thinking about the past. I'm Roger, this meeting is fate, really. Let's turn the world upside down together. I need to see their adventures together. I would love to see Goldie Roger and his pirates with Rayleigh. There's just so many possibilities of like what I want to see. There's just not enough time. I would want another like life-size adventure again. And I bless order, he needs time off. He does. But I kind of want to say that, okay? Anyway, that is volume 61 done. Finally, I feel like I've been reading this for ages because I have. This was the end of the post-war arc. It had the entire Return of Sabody arc in it in the start of Fishman Island. So now we are on to volume 62. I freaking love this cover. Look at that rainbow. This is such a colorful cover. I'm just so excited to get to Fishman Island. Oh my God, this is the pirate adventure of my dreams. I don't know if you guys know this, but for years and years and years, I've been looking for the best pirate story of my life. I was obsessed with Pirates of the Caribbean way back in the day when it came out. It overtook my life and I've never been able to find a pirate story to rival it. I've been looking through books, other movies, TV shows, and nothing just came up to scratch for me. And I've been thinking about One Piece for a long time, thinking it's like the best pirate story since Pirates of the Caribbean I've ever read. And obviously it's more than just a pirate story, of course. But like, just what happened in this chapter, it's just... It's the pirate adventure of my dreams, as I've mentioned. I love it. We've come across the Kraken. The Kraken. Oh my god, and it looks terrifying. I mean, I don't know if you can see it very well in the camera or anything, but... Oh, this is what adventure means. This is what adventure entails. In seeing the Kraken... Ah, oh, and even Luffy wants to tame it. Like, come on. <laughs> Although, to be fair, I feel like... He's got a good chance. He's got a good shot at doing that now. I didn't even mention this at the end of the last chapter, but Caribou is chasing after the Straw Hats. He's also gone under the water and he's behind the ship and he wants to kill them there and then. And Momu, who we met in the All on Park Hawk and Nami even recognised it. And she was like, don't I know you? Um, oh, but bless. Was it Sanji or somebody kicked him? Aren't you Momu of the All on Pirates? He looks kind of familiar. Yeah, it was bloody Sanji. Oh, poor Momo. Momo has ended up helping them because Karibo is getting all of his pirates to go on to the Thousand Sunny, but because of Momo, he only gets himself on the ship. Not all of them get on it, so it's just Karibo. And Karibo turned into such a weakling, actually, as soon as he realized he was by himself, and he was like, oh, I'm not really the pirate captain of the, of the ship. Please, like, spare me and stuff. I'm just like, okay. He went from being, like, really terrifying to really pathetic in like two pages. I'm still kind of scared of him because I feel like the way he is and the way his character is, is so unpredictable. He could do anything, but I mean, he's kind of a coward face to face, but sometimes they can make the most dangerous of enemies. 
So I'm going to keep an eye on him. I will. I'll keep an eye on him. But it was a really interesting chapter. I just fucking love it. I love it. This is the adventure that I've been waiting for for so long. So long. Like, this is the perfect adventure to come back to as well for the Straw Hats all together. And Nami explains so much about the currents as well and getting to Fishman Island, stuff like that. And I was just nodding along pretending that I could understand and I just didn't. I just didn't. It's just not stuff that I process. I'm just here for the ride, just like I think half of the Straw Hats are. And I'm just gonna trust Nami. I'm just gonna trust her as the navigator to get us to where we need to be. I love that, oh my God, my cats are being so cute right now. Can I take a little video of you guys? Hiya, babies. Oh, you're so cute. Hello. Hello. I think it looks like Sandy's getting like blood transfusions and stuff every time he has one of those major nosebleeds. Literally, he kicks Caribou in the face because Caribou called Nami a cutie, and then he just suddenly shoots him in the air with a big nosebleed. Now that's a problem, right? Like, what? Like, it's not just for laughs. Like, that is actually something serious. Like, we need is what? Oh, Momo is so cute. Anyway, yeah, great chapter. I'm starting to see major parallels to the Jaya arc, how Luffy, Zoro, and Sanji leave the ship. You know, like, I think it was when they were salvaging, and it just reminded me of that, and it was, like, so much fun. And, yeah, so they've kind of made themselves, like, a sort of suit to be able to go out into the water, and it's, yeah, Luffy, Zoro, and Sanji again, and they're kind of more up close and personal with the Kraken. And I love the fact that the people who are still on the ship are like defending the ship and they all have like a role to play. So like even Robin got in on the action, Frankie, Chopper. And I was like, Chopper, yes, he's like doing things. And that's what I wanted him to do for a long time. Like he's really coming out into his own. I think, ugh, I, I didn't want to mention anything beforehand because again, I was still so confused over the whole situation, especially where the island Sanji ended up on. Yeah, I'm... It, uh, for two years I ran from those abominations, you call this a monster, it's nothing compared to them. And it's given major transphobia right there. So I, I can't, I can't get behind him on this. And I do need to know more about his time on the island now. Because Charlie, Charlie, it's not just because, I'm still a little hazy on the island in general, but I'm pretty sure it was a kingdom where I think people were born male, but have adopted female traits, whether that's through like dressing as women or actually changing their sex to become women. Like like what we've seen in, um, was it Okama Land? Or Nakama Land in Impel Down? So like we've seen stuff like that before. So it's just, now like Sanji calling them like not real women and calling them abominations, it's, it's painful. Really, it's so painful to read. I'm hoping we have some kind of explanation for this. Like something else must have happened. It can't just be because in Sanji's eyes, they're not real women. You can't just be calling them abominations for that alone. Did they do something to him that he wasn't consenting to? I, I don't get it. I, I, I don't get this hatred. I don't get this hatred. Are his nosebleeds and the way he's reacting around Nami like even more heightened because of, I guess, the hatred that Sanji has for the 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 women who were on the island he ended up on. What? So hopefully I'm gonna get more of an explanation in this arc to do around Sanji and his time on the island because I, I'm getting uncomfortable with it now. I really am. When it was kind of brought up a little bit in the previous arc, I kind of just glossed over it because I wasn't sure how serious it was, or if it was just Sanji joking, and it was like some kind of weird humor that I just wouldn't get. But like, this chapter kind of solidified that for me, I think. Anyway, moving on from that, it was again, a really great chapter fighting this Kraken. And honestly, terrifying how they've ended up so low down in the ocean that it's this dark. And I love the fact that Frankie has nipple lights <laughs> in order to light the place up. That's hilarious. But yeah, they still have so much more to go. And I'm just like, this is like an in insane adventure, like really insane adventure. I am loving that aspect of it so much. I just need Sanji to shut his mouth. <laughs> Caribou is just so dumb. Come on. <laughs> so I think he turns into mud, right? That's what Frankie says. So I'm not surprised he has that kind of power. He turns to mud. 
He literally turns into dirt. Because, like, he is, he's, he is dirt. He is dirt. I'm sorry, but he, he freaks me out. He's got those eyes and that tongue. Weird. And he's just so intent on killing them. Not even just fighting them or hurting them. And he wants to kill them. It's just terrifying. Like, I don't even think previous antagonists have ever been so bloodthirsty before. It's really unsettling. But he is trapped in a barrel now, so he's got what he deserves. I am not surprised Luffy did end up taming the Kraken. I do kind of wish we saw like how that happened. I guess they just sort of knocked it into submission and now the Kraken is like on our side. Especially since we had this really creepy moment where the Flying Dutchman, well actually no, first before that even happens, that giant, what did they call it? An anglerfish? I only know them from Finding Nemo with a big light on it. Yeah, one of those giant ones. And then there is a different giant person who they think is a sea spirit. Captain Van Der Decken will be angry. So that's not Captain Van Der Decken, but somebody who works for him. I'm not sure of the name, but yeah, they are still enemies though, even though he saves them temporarily because he wants the, the, the treasure and stuff. And then yeah, we see the Flying Dutchman, which again is so terrifying because it just comes out of the darkness. And it looks so scary. Like, it looks so, so scary. It's almost like in Thriller Bark when we had Brook Ship come out, like, the fog and stuff. And I just, <laughs> that's why I absolutely love the fact that Brook is the one screaming, a ghost ship! <laughs> and Usopp shouting, why are you scared? Well, honestly, I think Brook is probably one of the biggest scaredy cats of them all. Like, remember when that little ghost came through? Was it one of Perona's ghosts or something Um, in Thriller Bark? And he's, like, having dinner or something or he's sitting around the table with the straw hats and that ghost comes through and Brooke loses it because he's so scared. Oh, I love the fact that he is a skeleton who's scared of scary things. It's hilarious. But yeah, what an incredible moment when they come back with a Kraken. But oh yeah, and now the submarine volcano is about to erupt. They can't have a pleasant, stress-free journey to the next island, can they? Like, everything's kicking off. Everything. Everything that could possibly go wrong is going wrong. I'm just like, I know they said, what was it, like, 70% of ships that go down get lost or they just don't end up in Fishman Island. Like, it's very, very dangerous. But even, like, that 30% or however many percent got through, I'm like, how? How? Because this is, like, stressful for them. It's not easy in the slightest. And I'm glad because it would be a disservice to this world if it was just an easy journey, because then anybody could do it, right? It, it makes sense how hard it would be, but I'm just feeling bad for them. I'm feeling bad for them because I, I'm sure they just want to have a bit of a rest. Although saying that, well, they have just had two years away from each other. Like they've probably had all the rest that they need. Unless it was Sanji, because I, again, I have no idea what happened on that bloody island. Rest, I wouldn't exactly say they had two years of rest. They've been training and training hard, but they haven't been going on these grand adventures like we're going on now. So even though they have been training for two years, it is like a break from the adventuring. So yeah, I know what I mean in my head, okay? <laughs> still loving it. Still loving the fact that we're still under the ocean and we got to see the bottom of it and this flying Dutchman now. It's just, oh, it's so rich in pirate lore. I love it. Under the sea. Under the sea. We have finally made it to Fishman Island. There is one more obstacle in the way, but I have every confidence that we will overcome the obstacles and I'm loving the connections to Arlong Park because of the whole fishman aspect of it and how it's probably going to make me rethink the entire Arlong Park arc. I've heard a few people say that you do get a whole lot more context after this arc to do with like fishmen and especially after South of the Archipelago too. There were other you know things going on in that world like context wise that made me rethink a lot of the things that happened. But I'm so ready to learn more about Fishmen, to see how they live, to see Fishman Island up close and personal. It's literally right there. It's so close. We've been talking about this for so long and we're nearly, nearly there. We do get stopped by a pack of sea beasts ridden by Fishmen. They bring up the whole Arlong Pirates thing. You crush the ambitions of the Arlong Pirates. But two years ago, you protected Hachi, one of Arlong's former officers. And we heard you beat up those detestable celestial dragons. So like that has worked in its favor a little bit, but Hammond, Hammond, and I love the design. I love the design. This is why I've been so excited for the Fishman Island arc, because I knew the designs of the characters would be a lot different to what we've seen before. And I really feel like Order's imagination will really come to life with this. So we can even see with Hammond's 
design. It just looks so fantastical. Are you with us or against us? Will you submit to the new Fisherman Pirates or do you refuse? So yeah, he wants them to submit to them. And obviously, you know, Luffy's not going to do that either or the Straw Hat Pirates. So I feel like there's going to be a little bit of a battle maybe in the next chapter and they're not going to get in there easily. It's a bit like Skype here, you know, how they were supposed to pay a toll to get in and they didn't. So like they became fugitives like way before they even really set foot on Skype here. It's like they can't just enter this island and be okay. There has to be some kind of toll to pay. And it seems like the toll in this one is to fight. There are the explosions of the underwater volcano and the way that the sea creatures were just running away so scared, even the Kraken. Poor Surame, bless. <laughs> even Robin's like, what an awkward way of running. <laughs> I'm just so happy now that we are essentially at our destination. We just need to get through the bloody doors. I've said bloody a lot in this video. Wow, I need to cut that out. I'm just British. Oh yay, we get to see Kami again. And she is just as adorable as I remember her. Just so helpful, you know? I love the fact that she's like, hey, have some soup. It'll warm you up. Wait, it's cold soup. Wait, you can't warm up a cold soup. She's just like such a great ally to our straw hats. I love her. I also love the design of the inside of Fishman Island, although this is just a small part of it. But it's definitely given me some like Atlantic hair Little Mermaid vibes. So that's awesome. Also, this is not the old blue, right? Because Sanji sees all of the mermaid, the mermaid inlet, and they are absolutely beautiful. They are stunning. I will give him that. But then he's like, oh, this is the old blue. I found it. Let's have a look. Yeah, I finally found it, the old blue. But surely it's not. Even Usopp's like, so your quest is over, Sanji? It's, that's not the old blue. Come on. Come on. I think it's just Sanji overreacting. He's seen these beautiful women. He's like, oh, this is my dream all along. It wouldn't surprise me. It's, it's, this is not the old blue. It wouldn't surprise me too much. Considering Sanji's dream was to see women naked without them knowing it. I do like Sanji, okay? There's just things about this arc so far. I'm just a little bit like, oh, like Sanji. I love the fact that the Straw Hats were just like absolutely not to the people guarding Fishman Island when they were saying like, you need to submit to us. But they ended up going through. Now they're separated, which I'm like, oh, this seems to happen like in every arc almost. They just get separated. I'm like, we've been separated for two years. Come on. Come on, I'm sure they'll find their way back to each other with no issues. Fingers crossed. Yeah, so we have Luffy, Chopper, Usopp and Sanji together. So hopefully the other ones are okay. I'm sure they are. I'm sure they're fine. Although we end the chapter with this guy here. He reminds me a little bit of Arlong. I don't think it's the same person. But they do mention Arlong again. It's it's not Arlong. I don't think that's Arlong. But somebody who looks very much like Arlong could be related. And yeah, bring the straw hats to him. And then we also have some mermaids finding the barrel with Caribou inside it. Oh no, they're gonna open it. They're gonna open it and let him out. So I don't know who the villains or antagonists are in this arc. There seems to be a few different ones. There was this guy from the end of the chapter. There was the crazy captain from the Flying Dutchman mentioned earlier on as well. There's Caribou. What's going on? Oh, it's raining as well. Beautiful. Beautiful weather for reading. I'm going to make myself a coffee and continue. Can't believe it's only been six chapters. Like, this has been the first six chapters and already I'm like, my mind has been blown with how much adventure and how much we're getting in just the first six chapters alone. It's just been non-stop. Only six chapters? I feel like I've read more. Oh gosh, I genuinely thought that the Neptune brothers were going to be against us, but it turns out at the end of the chapter, they have a message to give them from Jimbe, who isn't even there. And I was so hoping that we would see him, which we still might, to be fair. But it doesn't look like he's at Fishman Island right now. But even just seeing that panel of him for just a second oh, filled me with so much warmth. I love Jimbe. Whoa, look at all those seagulls. Wow. Oh my gosh. Oh, bro, look at them. Sorry, I'm so distracted. My cats just will not leave me alone. So yes, I've loved Jim Bay since Impel Down, really. And it will be great to see him again. And, and we might, we still might, by the end of the arc. So we do meet the princes. We do have the princes there, uh, the Neptune brothers. And yeah, it turns out like, they have a message from him. And I thought that they were bad people to begin with. Well, not bad people, just against the Straw Hats. I mean, they have entered illegally, so, you know. Rules are rules, I guess. What's the message? Okay, Sanji's having another nosebleed. 
And I feel like it's okay now because I think we're going to get into the politics of Fishman Island and like the history of it as well, especially the discrimination that the Fishmen have been facing for years and years and years because they do need a transfusion for Sanji. He has a very rare blood type. Unfortunately, the blood between humans and Fishmen, they can use it. But yeah, there was that Hammond person who we saw before. It's like, you humans are an inferior race. You feared us and called us monsters. You were the ones who refused to mix your blood. The death of Fisher Tiger was no different. He was the hero of Fishman Island. He didn't care what race anyone was and he risked his life to free the slaves. And the humans were too heartless to give Fisher Tiger their blood because they didn't want their blood to mix. So it seems like this is going to be a very interesting look into the history of Fishman and the relationship that they've had with humans. So that's going to be really good. And I, I'm not too fussed about the whole Sanji nosebleed and why it's happening because I think it's going to amount to something worth learning in this world. The person who I think was at the end of the previous chapter who I thought looked like Arlong is called Hordy Jones. So that's who it is. So yeah, they've just had no chance of them. So they've run away from those fishmen and the Neptune brothers and they're with Kami going into like, I guess the town area of this place to find a donor for Sanji. So honestly, it is really exciting stuff. I just need to know what happened to the other Straw Hats now. <laughs> I need to know. And where is Jimbe? I want Jimbe. Oh, damn. Looks like Luffy will bring Rowan to Fishman Island. Madame Charlie is very interesting. I love the fact that she's a fortune teller and the fact that she even foresaw Whitebeard's death, which is something I never foresaw. I didn't even foresee Ace's death. And Madame Charlie did. I'm like, why didn't you? Well, it says that she can't change. Or it says that every time she has... Well, like, there is a crystal ball, and what she sees in it happens. Like, nothing changes it. So I guess even if she had a said something, and maybe she did say something, and we just don't know about it. But she's screaming, drive Luffy off the island right now. The human with a straw hat, straw hat Luffy, he will bring Rowan to Fishman Island. I mean, to be fair, I think this is part of the vision. And anyone could be wearing the straw hat, right? Maybe it's just somebody who is trying to frame Luffy to get him off the island, maybe. Oh, maybe Madame Charlie knows it's not Luffy and she's only saying that. No, why would she do that? Why would she do that? You know, she lives on Fishman Island, so she won't want it brought to ruin. So, yeah, she probably just didn't see him properly. She just saw the straw hat and thought, you know what? It's him. Sanji did get some blood, but, and he better be grateful. He better be grateful to them. It was twin pirate Splash and Splatter who look like Okama, and they're the ones who have saved him with the blood transfusion. Look, Sanji better be grateful. He better say thank you. I know he seems s really surprised in the panel there, but hopefully it's just the initial shock and he will come to his senses and say thank you. But it does look like they couldn't get a single fishman to donate any blood. Why won't the fishman give us any blood? We ran all over town, but we couldn't find any humans. But honestly, I feel like this is something that is rooted so deeply into the culture here at Fishman Island that I'm hoping that we have a really good way of exploring that. It could go either way. It really could. Because right now with Sanji and his apparent transphobia, I, I don't want to say... Because I might be reading too much into it. I might be reading too much into it. But that's just how it feels so far. But saying that though, I still freaking love this story. Madame Charlie is extremely beautiful. I love her introduction. I love the fact that Luffy asked, do mermaids poo? And she's like, vulgar boy. And she becomes like quite terrifying. <laughs> Hilarious. And I knew Luffy would ask a silly question like that. Didn't he ask Kami that as well? Back in Savage Archipelago, did she not answer? I can't remember now. I mean, he might not have even asked her. I might have made that up. Also, we got to see Papa Goo again. And I love the fact that Brook is being the soul king and he's doing a lot of like singing and stuff and people are loving him. But I did miss him so much. Also, somebody was mentioned who's another emperor. One of the four emperors. Because one thing I was also, okay. One thing I was also quite worried about with Fishman Island, especially after Whitebeard died, was the fact that Whitebeard was protecting Fishman Island. So after his death, I was like, oh no, it's going to be chaos and Fishman Island is probably going to be no more. But it looks like Big Mom, she has sort of taken over. All she asks for in exchange is loads of sweets every month. That's what the factory is for. And Luffy like really wants to meet her. I want to meet her. I want to meet her. I don't know if this is like the first time we've heard of Big Mom, but I had heard of Big Mom before and it might be because there is probably a card deck 
or something coming up. I don't know, I might have made that up. But I am excited to meet her. But now I'm just a little bit worried because of how we ended the chapter. I'm worried for Luffy's safety on this island. Especially if the entire island is now going to be against him. Because obviously no one wants it to be ruined. So the honeymoon period is already over, probably. Okay, with this chapter, I feel like I get a sense of what the main antagonists want. At least I think they're the main antagonists of this arc. Okay, so correct me if I'm wrong. Or just like wait until I correct myself later on. I think it's Hottie Jones and his crew, the, the new fishmen. The new fishmen pirates, I think they're called. We have quite a few of them. And it seems like they want the humans to fear them and they want to take over the throne of Fishman Island because they think that the current sea god, King Neptune, who was riding this cute baby whale, so cute, they think he's too weak. That is what I think the main conflict is going to be in this arc, maybe. So there could potentially be some kind of civil war thing going on here between the new Fishman pirates and the sea god and his army, maybe. I don't know. So that'd be a really interesting storyline to expo, especially with how the Straw Hats being humans will fit into that. Speaking of Straw Hats, we got to see Nami again. And of course, of course, she's trying to get a major discount in one of Papagoo's stores. Or I think it's just his main store, actually. And then he's like, you don't need a discount. We owe you big time for what you did two years ago. Take whatever you want for free. Literally, they do. They take absolutely everything. The store is empty. <laughs> it's just so funny. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I think Holly Jones might be the main, main bad guy. I think they took some like steroids as well or some like kind of energy pills as well. I'm clueless. I, I don't know what that entails. I'm sure it'll be important later on. There was also a crab hand gyro I think we got introduced to here. I think they just ran away. They were a, a pirate ship that was about to go to Fishman Island, but they, they ran away, I think. Maybe they come back, I don't know. I don't know if they're important or not, if it was just a, a throwaway scene. We now have run into Nami. Surely the other straw hats are just behind her. I want to say them all together again. We've just gotten back together. So come on. Where are they? Where's Robin? Where's Frankie? <laughs> Where's Zoro? Wow, I was not expecting the princess to be as big as she is. She's like one of those giant mermaids. And Luffy is small fry compared to her. She's... Stunning though, she is very beautiful. But she seems to be very paranoid or very protective of herself. She's like, have you come here to kill me too? I'll have you know I'm not afraid of you. And she was behind this like, large door and it was very dark. So maybe, maybe she's being protected because people are out to kill her often? I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. She is the princess after all. But oh my God, the detail, the detail behind the palace, the, the castle, Incredible. This is one incredible place. It's huge. It's beautifully detailed. One of the most beautifully detailed panels I've ever seen in One Piece. It's exactly how I would picture, in fact, no better than what I would picture, a underwater castle. I forgot to mention in the previous chapter, but the king invited the Straw Hats to the castle. So they're there now. Zoro had already made it. When they mentioned, oh, we have one of your Straw Hats and we said something about drinking and he started drinking before everyone got there. And they were like, yep, yeah, it's Zoro. Robin is also searching for history, so she's fine. And Frankie is also searching for a relative of Tom's, who we heard about in Water 7. I wonder if there's a Ponyglyph in Fishman Island. Hmm. But also I'm getting major Water 7 flashbacks, actually, because they're kind of having a council meeting, like some of the Fishmen, and with Madame Charlie, I think her name was. And she's telling them about what she saw. And yeah, they're talking about girls being kidnapped in Mermaid Inlet. They're talking about the vision that Madame Charlie had. So the Straw Hats are probably going to get blamed for everything. Whereas at the start of the chapter, it was a bit of a flashback to the mermaids who opened that barrel with Caribou in there. And yeah, he has the swamp swamp fruit, apparently. And he can make a muddy bottomless swamp. He kidnaps the mermaids or like they're sinking in his mud. And what well, he can like retain them. Or something? I I don't know how it works completely, but he's going to take them back to the surface and sell them. And he's going to kidnap as many mermaids as he possibly can. So we have like another antagonist, because I totally forgot about him actually. <laughs> when I was talking about Hottie Jones, we also have Caribou also here wreaking havoc. Is there anybody else? There was the Captain of the Flying Dutchman, although they said he's a descendant of the Captain of the Flying Dutchman. So we could potentially have three different antagonists in this arc, potentially, maybe. Hmm, okay. So yeah, Vanderdecken the Ninth, I think it was, is teaming up with Holly Jones in order to 
Well, they're the ones who are going to bring Rowan to Fishman Island, not the Straw Hats. Yeah, we will bring Rowan to the kingdom of Ryugu. We're going to take the head of the sea god, Neptune. It is a scary alliance, as well as having Karabor running around wreaking havoc himself. Every single time the Straw Hats go somewhere, this happens. <laughs> Vanadagen is trying to get the mermaid princess to marry him and he threatens her life. Like, this is the reason why she's been locked up for 10 years and he can also throw an axe that always hits a target but Luffy manages to deflect it. I feel a bit bad for her actually. She she seems a little bit Rapunzel-esque but also the fact that Luffy... <laughs> Luffy doesn't like... It, it reminded me of when he met Colby actually and he's eating all the food and he can't stand her crying and he says you're huge but you're a big weakling and a cry baby i hate you ha 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 bless <laughs> i mean it's not nice but that's luffy isn't it it's just it reminds me so much of when he met colby for the first time he's too honest he's too honest he doesn't actually like hate her in that sense he's offered to take her out for a walk but that's gonna blow up in his face that's not gonna go well zoro also broke out of jail i believe <laughs> he heard them having fun so he brought out of jail because the guards are trying to capture the Straw Hats while Brook, Usopp and Nami. And obviously Zoro isn't having it that he can hear them having fun without him. So it looks like we have a fight on our hands. These volumes are long. There are so many chapters in these volumes. Right now I still have one chapter left of this volume. It feels like I've been reading this volume for ages. I'm not complaining though. I'm not complaining. I'm going to theorise that maybe Karabo takes the Straw Hat and that's what... She says in the prophecy, Madame Charlie saw in the prophecy, maybe it was Carabal who she actually saw, maybe. Maybe. You know, I keep forgetting we're in the new world, and it didn't even cross my mind that the log pause won't really be any good in the new world. Like, that just... I would not last two seconds in the One Piece world, I fear. But then again, Nami herself didn't realise that too, so maybe I will be okay. But I'm just wondering, like, what else would they need to navigate the new world if not for a log pause. So I'm excited for a bit more world building and maybe some new gadgets. We finally get the message from Jimbe that he relayed and what was his name again? Fukuboshi is one of the princes and he is the one who got the message from Jimbe. So he tells Zoro the two messages. First, do not fight Hori, as in Hori Jones. Why? I do not know. Second, I await you in the forest of the sea. So it turns out that where the princess wants to go is to the forest of the sea. So that's where they're heading to now. And, oh my god. Like, it's a bit gross, the fact that she is hiding in her pet shark <laughs> in order to go undetected. However, Luffy's on the top there, pointing the way, and he's now a wanted fugitive. I don't think they're going to get very far. <laughs> but if he's going to the forest of the sea, does that mean we're going to say Jimbei? earlier than planned? Because I will do anything to see him again. Hilariously, the Straw Hats have accidentally taken over the castle and have tied up pretty much all of King Neptune's men. <laughs> it just shows you like how powerful they are now. I think Usopp is the one who said, we were just trying to distract you so that we could actually run away, but then they end up overpowering all of them. Hilarious. But now I'm worried for this kingdom because if Hori and Van Der Decken, if they're after the kingdom, to take the crown from him. Like, he does say he's getting old. I'm a bit worried that they're actually gonna do it. So really it is up to the Straw Hats to protect this kingdom, unknowingly, because they don't know that this is happening just yet. And they have Fishman Island against them now because they think that they're gonna bring ruin. But it's not actually gonna be them. It's gonna be people themselves. It's gonna be their own Fishmen. But yeah, it was a good chapter, a sprinkling of the new world to add more intrigue. And that was volume 62 done. And now I'm going on to volume 63, which feels even thicker than the previous volumes. How many chapters is in this one? Wow, there's 12 chapters in this volume. And I'm not surprised actually, because Fishman Island is a bit of a lengthier arc. I wonder if the person that JB mentions at the very end, Queen Orohime, is the one that the princess is looking for. A grave I've never been able to visit. It's a place I want to go more since these last 10 years. I wonder if Queen Orohime is the princess's mother. Well, it makes sense that, doesn't it? Obviously. Obviously it's her mum. And she wants to go and see the grave of her mum because she's never been able to go before. Oh, how sad is that though? And she's been locked up these last 10 years as well. So obviously something happened 10 years before that meant the death of the queen and sort of like the imprisonment of the princess. Not imprisonment is in like, it's still imprisonment. She's been locked away. She hasn't been allowed to go out. So even though it's from her own family, it was most likely for her protection. 
So that's interesting that Jim is there right now and talking to her as they're about to head there themselves. So Luffy will be able to see him for the first time in a while. We got a lot with Holly Jones and Van... What's his name again? Van Der Decken? I keep wanting to say Van Der Beek because I'm sure there is a an actor, Van Der Beek. I think he was in Dawson's Creek. It's not named after him, is he? <laughs> Poor Hachi has been beaten up by the new Fisherman Pirates and Sanji and Chopper have come across him. But at least, at least, Hachi knows the truth about the new Fisherman Pirates about to invade and the kingdom will be laid to waste. So at least somebody knows the bigger plan. Hopefully that spreads and the straw hats can be let off and not be fugitives in Fishman Island. Yeah, it's just a lot of talking. A lot of talking in this chapter between the new Fishman pirates and what they want to do. As well as Vanderdecken, he has a glove on one hand and I think it's the one where he touched the princess 10 years before. And he can only have two powers at once like he can throw something and it would like hit the target but i think he has to touch them first and whatever he throws will always reach them so he's covering that hand because again he wants to marry the princess he sounds a lot like absalom in that sense but i'm honestly just excited for the reunion between luffy and jimbo i like the commentary on humans in this chapter it was a little bit brief but it was a conversation between frankie and den and den is the younger brother of tom so he's gonna help call the thousand sunny so that we can get the hell out of here. But Frankie asks why he didn't really look like Tom. On Fishman Island, no one is surprised, no matter what their child looks like. We never quite understood why you humans separate people according to their looks. Yes. And I feel like a lot of the commentary we're gonna get in this of why the humans have been so discriminatory against the fishmen is because of how different they look. Especially since the fishmen who are wanting to take over have so much hatred for the human race. Humans are an inferior race that can't even breathe underwater. It is our destiny to rule over them. So it's interesting to see this come from hundreds of years of oppression to see them fighting back. It just so happens that this is all happening when the Straw Hats finally make it to the New World. Also, Vanderdecken and Holly Jones have managed to come into the palace thanks to the Straw Hats. And, you know, that they've already kind of beaten the palace guards and they've got the king, the, the Neptune king, all tied up. And yeah, they couldn't have planned it better, could they? Like, it's very easy for them. So a lot of accidental things happening right now. <laughs> it's like the plot is happening to the Straw Hats right now. The Forest of the Sea is extremely gorgeous as well. And it's also a graveyard of ships. The currents bring all the sunken ships, yeah. So the Thousand Sunny is there, Frankie is there, Robin's on her way there, because I think there might be a Poneglyph here. And Jim Bay is there as well, because Jim Bay is a wanted criminal, so he's not allowed in Fishman Island. So he is waiting patiently. And honestly, I can't think of a better place to wait, because it's gorgeous. It's beautiful there. It looks calm and serene. Well, maybe until Luffy gets there, then we'll see. I'm actually surprised we're getting these confrontations this early on in the arc. I still feel like I'm quite early in. I'm only on chapter 618. 617 is just what I've read. And yeah, Zoro is now, I think, facing off with Hottie Jones underwater as well, which is so cool and epic. I cannot wait to see how that fight unfolds. Nami just went off and disappeared, but I think it's bringing back a lot of trauma from Arlong Park and what she went through, like Belmier, I think her name was, and what Arlong did. It's bringing a lot of bad memories back to her. The princess has been revealed. Uh, she couldn't stay inside her pet shark forever. So now she's out in the open. And now I think everyone's gonna assume that, yeah, maybe Luffy did kidnap the princess. Honestly, they're just getting themselves further and further into trouble the more these chapters are going on. We'll learn a little bit more about Hardy Jones and yeah, it's, it's good to know. I don't know if you can say this very well, I will put it up to the camera, but you can actually see the seven warlords of the sea as children in the SBS corner and they look so cute. They are honestly so adorable. Ooh. Anyway, back to this chapter. I just love how pretty much everyone is coincidentally on their way to the forest of the sea. Nami did escape and she is on the back of Kami. And yeah, she's taken her to the Forest of the Sea. She wants to know more about Jimbe. And she also mentioned something about Jimbe left a message for Luffy telling him not to fight Hori. I think I now know why. I, I wanna know. I wanna know. I don't know why he doesn't want them to fight Hori. But also the fact that in the next page, it looks like Zoro has overcome him. I mean, he's probably not dead or anything. Probably just KO'd. Does he know something about something? <laughs> 
that he needs to be alive for. We have to fight back though, we can't just let him win. And that Van Der Decken person is probably just as bad as Absalom. If you won't love me, you don't deserve to live. And he says that to the princess and he's just a scumbag. He's just an absolute scumbag. But fortunately Luffy does kind of temporarily beat him and they're still on their way to the the forest of the sea. And it was a good little scene, a good little fight, but nothing too strenuous for our straw hats. They really have come a long way. They really have since the time skip. They're just oh, amazingly strong. And what is the deal with Sanji turning into stone when he sees the mermaid princess? I... Even Chopper's like, don't turn around, you'll die. And he's not stone anymore. He does return to normal, he's just unconscious. He turned to stone from joy. But like, why? Like, what's going on? What's going on with Sanji? Like, this is just odd. It's just odd at this point. I need to know. Oh, we had a bit of a dramatic reveal there at the end. Although, I believe we already knew that Jinbei released all along, all those years ago, into the East Blue. I'm, I'm sure I, th I thought I knew that. Which, you know, this is, I think, maybe the first time Luffy and Nami have heard that he was the one to do it. Although it has more emotional weight for Luffy because Luffy is the one who has formed this connection with Jinbei. Whereas this is the first time Nami's met him. So I don't know what this means for Luffy and Jinbei. I don't think it'll put a wedge between them. I doubt it, especially considering how huge an impact Jinbei had on Luffy at Marineford and even in Pearl Down and the connection he had with Ace, for example. Oh, I miss Ace. <laughs> I miss him so much. <laughs> don't really have much to say about the chapter. <laughs> Other than, one, it looks like Sanji is cured. He seems fine now. Two, Hardy Jones kind of came to after his fight with Zoro. So it doesn't look too good for Zoro, Usopp and Brook. So I think they're in danger, girl. And also it was so sad to see the mermaid princess at the grave of her mother because she's never been able to visit there that is so sad and the fact that even Jinbei says she has a lot to say you know she wasn't there for a funeral she couldn't because of bloody Vander Decken I keep wanting to call him Vanderbeek because of Vander Decken she missed out so much so I really do hope that she knocks him the f out because the way that he's had her scared for her life for 10 years in the hopes that she will marry him pig what a pig so I really do hope she's the one to beat him I really do because how dare he make her live in fear for that long and to have him miss her own mother's funeral that's so sad but I'm really connecting with the characters in this I really do feel for the princess I love the fact that we have Jinbei back and also Hachi Hachi needs major attention medical wise so I hope Chopper can help so I'm really glad I'm connecting with the secondary characters in this arc. Oh my gosh, of course, Fisher Tiger. We heard about him in the Amazon Lily arc, the person who rescued Boa Hancock and her sisters from the slavery on Sabri Archipelago. Why did I forget that name? I'm so glad I remember it now. And also it was just like slowly starting to come back to me as we mentioned the Sun Pirates, because I'm sure we heard so much more about them in Amazon Lily. And yeah, just like all of this backstory that's in this chapter, so vital and so important. I'm like, oh, I'm so glad we're getting this because I did forget some things, especially about Fisher Tiger, but also it's delving into so much like in this chapter, even Jinbei says, the core of the government decided to join hands with the fishermen, but under the surface, the roots of their racism still run deep. And there were two people on Fishman Island who tried to change the tragic course of history, which was the queen and Fisher Tiger. And they had different ways of doing it, which kind of, I guess led to the downfall of both because Fisher Tiger formed the Sun Pirates and wanted to free all of the slaves while the Queen was hoping to form a bond so that she could convince them that they can live in harmony or in peace. Hearing this now is just incredible and also to get Nami and her feelings on Arlong too and what happened. It's great to see how she approaches the subject because even now we're faced, because wasn't it at the start of Sabri Archipelago when she reunites with Hachi and like she had a really visceral first reaction to him and then she kind of came around by the end of it. It's almost like she like learned from that experience when she's confronted with Jinbei who helped free him or unleashed him to the East Blue. Even though she does have 
that trauma of Belmia in her heart. She says, before I got to the Saudi archipelago two years ago, I never knew the mighty fishermen had been persecuted by humans. Then those kidnappers called Kami. I could hardly believe my eyes when I saw Sabri Park. And that parallel to Arlong Park just really hits Nami as she explains that. Arlong really hated humans. We went way too far. We also got mention of like the Reverie World Council and humans continuing to hate fishmen. So yeah, it does seem like a lot of the themes of Fishman Island is exploring the oppression of fishmen and the judgment that the humans have put on fishmen, mermaids, all of them. So that does add a whole new layer to what's happening in Fishman Island right now as Holly Jones, I'm trying to keep their names in my mind, as they are trying to take over, it, it adds just so much more context to them too. And obviously like they're not going like the right way about it, but it adds weight, you know? It adds weight to the whole situation. But I'm so glad that we're gonna get some flashbacks now to Jimmy, the Sun Pirates, all of that from the past. So good, I might be able to read one more chapter before I have True Crime and White Night tonight with my patrons. One more chapter. It's so strange to say Arlong at 25 years old, Jimbei at 30, so how old is Jimbei now? Like 46? I think, is this 16 years ago? Yeah, Fishman Island 16 years ago. We now go back in time. So not much to say about the chapter because I think it's slowly leading us into the dynamics between the fishermen back then, as well as the different ideals of the queen and Fisher Tiger, and also the divide as well within the Fishman Island and the people there. We do see the queen as, and I can kind of see where the princess gets it from now, as a quite an overtly emotional person, and yet so compassionate when she comes across a thief and she says that she's failed her people and to not do the crimes because it's like a circle, isn't it? So yeah, she seems to be like such a compassionate leader. And uh, now I feel awful knowing her fate. Although this does say 16 years ago. And if she died 10 years ago, then there's still like around about six years from now and her death. So whatever happens between this time will hopefully add a whole lot more to her as a character. Jimmy and Arlong butt heads. So like, I'm kind of wondering how he ends up letting Arlong go in the East Blue. I'm wondering how that all happens. So many questions, not enough thoughts on this chapter, but the onslaught of the Sun Pirates continued. Okay, okay. <laughs> I do wish I could just continue on, but I do have True Crime and Wine in 20 minutes. So I'm gonna drink some wine. I wanna see if I can try and finish this volume tonight after True Crime and Wine Night. But if not, I will probably see you in the morning. I definitely need a pick me up after watching the uh, True Crime documentary for True Crime and Wine Night. One Piece is definitely doing it for me. However, we are in a part of this where it's flashbacks and traumatic things happen during flashbacks. So I don't know if this is gonna be the pick me up that I wanted, but we do have more developments with Fisher Tiger, with Jimbei, Arlong back in the day. And I do really like seeing Arlong from beforehand to get a bit more context with him. So I am liking this. There was a human child who escaped when they freed all the slaves. And this poor child is just like constantly smiling and it's revealed that, you know, that they were a slave. And Jimbei says, if a slave cries or stops working, they can be killed. Slaves live in constant fear for their lives. And this poor child is constantly cleaning and wants to be useful in begging for them not to kill her. It's so heartbreaking, this whole thing. This whole thing has been gut-wrenching to see the divide between, like, the fishmen and the humans in what has become of years and years and years of this awful oppression, which does hold up a mirror to real life, to our own world and to our own society. Also just the discussion as well of, you know, don't kill people because then you're just like them kind of thing. And it's, you can really see the cracks showing, especially when it comes to Arlong, who is very bloodthirsty. So I just know that this is gonna end up in tragedy. It is very heavy right now and I was hoping for something a little bit lighter. And I think we have quite a lot of backstory coming up. So I kind of want to read all of the backstory tonight, which will take me to, well, apparently chapter 627, maybe. So let's do that. Do you want me to read you some one piece as a bedtime story, Ash? Do you?
Now I'm going to read Ash Some One Piece is a Bedtime Story. Ash is being so distracting right now. So distracting. Trying to read. Look at him. Look at him. Oh. <laughs> oh, he knows what you're doing. You know what you're doing. I'm a little bit confused because I thought Fisher Tiger died because humans refused to give him blood when he needed a transfusion. And that was the reason why he died. But it seems like he died because he was ambushed by Navy men or Marines in the island where they've dropped that kid off back to their home. And they ambushed him, they shot him, and he has managed to escape, but he has since died, which is so sad. And maybe they just told the lie that humans refuse the transfusion to stir up more hatred for humans. I'm assuming that's probably what happened, right? And now he's lying on me. Oh, he's determined, determined to distract. But there was a moment as well about children and them being sort of like the future, which sounds cliche, but it's true. It is so true about the next generation, hopefully learning from the mistakes of our ancestors of our past and hoping that they will unite and hoping that they will do things differently. And that's exactly what Fisher Tiger says. I mean, Fisher Tiger does refuse any blood from humans, and he does die with that hatred still, because he's been through so much. He himself was a slave, and he just can't forgive that, and that is his right. And I also forgot to mention that the Queen is trying to get everyone to sign a petition, and that's like her way of trying to unite humans and fishmen. But it looks like a lot of the fishmen don't really want to sign it. There's just a lot of food for thought with this. Okay, it makes sense that Arlong would be the one to say that the death of Fisher Tiger was because of humans. So I, I totally get that. That makes sense. They didn't refuse to give him blood, but they did shoot at him. So it's just so sad the way that it all had to unfold. And I feel so bad for the Queen as well, because she's trying so, so hard to unite her people with humans. And she's trying, she's giving speeches, she's getting the petitions, but a lot of people just don't want to hear it. The moment she has with her daughter, the moment where she's like, let's promise to make a better future, is so touching. And it makes me even more sad knowing that she's going to die. And with the Celestial Dragon requesting emergency stop, like there's a ship, a wrecked ship, requesting emergency entry to Fishman Island, and a Celestial Dragon is on the ship, I feel like this is when something really bad happens to the Queen. And I'm scared. Oh, the poor Queen, honestly. I am rooting for her. And even knowing what happens next, the racism and the oppression, the judgment of Fishman is still very prevalent in present day, whatever time One Piece is set in. There's still like leaps and bounds to go. It's just very interesting that this is the main storyline of Fishman Island and how this has tied to Arlong and how Jimbei did. I guess he kind of inadvertently released him after he became one of the Warlords of the Sea. So like, it's not like he maliciously released him into the wild, knowing he would do what he was going to do. There was no way really that Jimbei would know that, even though Arlong, he is very angry. He does have a right to be angry. He does embody the rage of Fishman. So like, we have so many different sides to this. We have Jimbei, who's trying to get progress. We have Arlong, who wants the humans to pay for what they've done. It's a really tricky situation for two people who used to be a lot closer. But I'm just terrified about what's gonna happen to the Queen. Ugh, and what it's gonna do to that alliance that we're trying to forge between the humans and the fishmen. It's just gonna blow up dramatically. My heart was in my mouth for the Queen there. I genuinely thought that maybe the Celestial Dragon shot her through the head, even after she just saved him, but I wouldn't have put it past the Celestial Dragon because, oh my God, they, I know I hate like Blackbeard, I know I hate Absalom. There are a lot of people I hate, but the Celestial Dragons boil my blood. They boil my blood. They act so privileged. And of course they think they are. They think they are high and mighty and powerful. And oh, it just pisses me off so much. And when he's confronted with the fishman slaves he used to own, and he is shouting all of this abuse at them, and they're like, we're going to kill him. We're going to just kill him. And everyone's like, yeah, we won't say anything. And then the queen defends him. The queen protects him. And she's like, the children are watching. And it's so powerful. It's such a powerful moment. And then the celestial dragon picks up the gun 
or whatever that contraption is. And I thought, I genuinely thought that he killed her right there and then. And that would have been devastating. Absolutely devastating. I'm glad it didn't kill her. I'm glad that she managed to go up into the human world. And it says that she has come back with a piece of paper that would become a ray of hope for all of Fishman Island. So I wonder what the paper is. I just, I still don't expect a good outcome out of this. For one, it's a flashback. And two, we know she dies. Oh, it's just, it's gonna be awful. They even help heal the Celestial Dragon after weeks. Just, like, incredible. Oh, also that Vanderdeck in person has sort of laid claim on the princess. Because I think she's been able to control the Neptunians. Is that what they said? Long ago, a mermaid princess had the uncanny ability to control Neptunians, yeah. And this Vanderdeck in person has laid claim on her. So that is because she can control the Neptunians. Okay, that part makes sense. He's still a creep. She is a child, but you know, he's an awful villain. And we knew this all along. But this pal right here did give me chills. Oh, that was so sad. I knew something was gonna happen. We all did, it was obvious. Oh, but she got shot. She got shot. We don't know who did it, but I I think it was that asshole Vanderdecken. In one of the panels, you can see him creeping up on the princess. Yeah, he looks happy and he's creeping up on the princess. It was it him. It was him or, or one of the other ones. Oh, that's so sad. Especially since she was so overwhelmed with joy when she was seeing people willingly giving her their signatures. Like, look at how happy she is. Like the tears in her eyes, like even I was welling up during this moment too. Everyone's just like lining up to do it. And even like the kids are the first ones there, like the children are the first ones too. And the queen asks, you're not just gonna ask for them back later, are you? And they're like, no, no way. And mom said she'll sign too, and she's just so happy. She's so happy that she can finally have them united, fishermen and humans. That is her like life's mission, her goal. And she's doing it for her children for her people, in her sons, the princes, doing the song and the dance so that the queen knows that they're gonna be okay and they're gonna look after the princess. And everyone else is like, stop doing that. Like the queen is fatally wounded, she needs medical attention. But they're like, hey, look at us, mom. Like you're gonna be fine, we'll protect our sister. And you know, please don't worry. Imbued her with so much hope and so much joy before she died. Oh, so goddamn touching but so heartbreaking too it's just like literally ripped my heart out really interesting though about the princess being able to control the neptunian so that's a huge huge thing in the wrong hands it could be so destructive so i think we're gonna get the end of the flashback chapters and go back in the present day and the stakes oh god if van der decken marries the princess and gets to control the neptunians scary stuff but I finished volume 63, and now I'm on volume 64. I think I can do a couple more chapters before bed. Ash is still lying next to me. I don't know if you can see him. Yeah, I can see him. I'm just chilling. And then we'll probably have to go to bed soon. I genuinely forgot that we were actually telling this story to Nami and Luffy and everyone. I, I forgot they were there. <laughs> but it did tie back nicely to the story of how Arlong got to where he was when we first met him, and Nami's pain and suffering. And... I mean, I'm not even going to talk about Sanju. He's just annoying. He's just annoying at the minute. And I'm sorry to all the Sanju lovers out there. He's just, he's annoying me so much. And anyway, I'm glad Nami could speak up for herself. And she's just so accepting of what's happened. And she doesn't blame Jimbe at all. And that's great. Honestly, like, it really does highlight Nami as a character. Like, such a big person in that regard. Like, she is just, mm. it's really late now, so I'm probably not making much sense. But she's just such a great character. She really is. I love the fact that Jimbei can also hopefully move on from any guilt he feels for letting Arlong, you know, kind of, for letting Arlong. It, it's more complicated than just him just letting Arlong run free. Jimbei didn't even really know about the trouble Arlong was causing. Otherwise, he would have put a stop to it. So yeah, that was such a sweet moment when he says thank you. And he genuinely genuinely means it. Love that we got more context with the current crisis with Holly Jones and the fact that Kim Neptune is intending to tell the world that the people of Fishman Island want to emigrate and there's going to be a reverie. Yeah, this is the end of the reverie. So yeah, I guess that's when all of the 
powers of the world meet up or something. And I'm glad they still have lots of signatures. Like a lot of fishmen do want to see the sun. And I want them to see the sun. I want them to be able to go up to the surface and be free. Be free to explore and roam the world just as they should. And Hottie Jones is trying to stop that from happening. He's trying to prevent it. So like now I'm even more emotionally invested in them overcoming Hottie Jones. Like it's much more now than just a sort of civil war for the, the throne. There's a lot more to it. There is way more to it. And I'm rooting for us now more than ever because I want the fishmen to be free. But obviously it's like really hard because humans haven't really given them the best chance in the past. And I can understand a lot of their trepidations and them being so reluctant to just go ahead with the plan with the signatures and stuff. But I am really rooting for them. <laughs> Usopp's Robin impression. I'm so glad we still have these impressions or impersonations. Uh, he looks just like Robin. Robin impersonation. I hope Nami hasn't been torn to pieces by some deep sea fish. Like that is Robin's humour. That is Robin's humour. Hilarious. I'm so glad. So glad we can still do that. Especially since Usopp, Brook, and Zoro are probably gonna, well no, they're not gonna die. They're not gonna die. But they're in danger. They're in immediate danger. They're locked in a cage. The room is filling up with water. How are they going to get out? Hmm? How are they going to get out? So the fact that he's doing this Robin impersonation is just funny. But Robin, we see her straight away reading a poneglyph. It reads almost like a letter or maybe an apology. But who is it apologizing to? Who are you, Joy Boy? Who is Joy Boy? And is this an English translation thing? Is this supposed to be something else? Because that does happen a lot. But oh my god, like this is so exciting. This is so, how am I supposed to go to sleep now? Holly Jones has broadcast to the entire kingdom about his intentions and he has the king all tied up. He's going to be the new king, but he has all of the petition signatures. And do you know how terrifying that is? Because that is a list of traitors to him. That's a list of traitors. So he's been getting everyone to step on a photo of the queen, which is awful, absolutely awful. But now he has a, a genuine list and he's like, these are all traitors. You're all going to die. What? And we also have a countdown now. That's like three hours until he's going to execute the king. I'm just like, we have another countdown. Just do it. Just go ahead and do it right now. Like, why are you counting down? This is a thing with One Piece villains, antagonists. Oh, it's going to be like five hours until I do something. That's going to like change everything. Just kill him now. Like, I don't want him to do that, obviously. But you know what I mean? Like, what's stopping you from doing it right now? Like... <laughs> but anyway, I'm not criticising it for that. It it adds stakes again. It it does. It adds that time bomb thing, that ticking time bomb. And oh, also, Luffy's now worth 400 million berries. That's a lot. A lot. But honestly, that broadcast was so terrifying. Holly Jones is like seriously becoming such a formidable foe. Oh, wow. He has the entirety of Fishman Island in a chokehold. Bloody incredible. Like, what do people think about this arc. Do people love it, hate it? I'm not 100% sure of the general reception to this arc, but so far I've been loving it. This has been so great to explore the themes and everything that has been revealed and talked about, just blowing my mind in the actual like action and stakes. There hasn't been really any fighting so far, which is fine by me, honestly. It's honestly just a lot of drama is what this is. This is drama. This is a list of traitors. Oh my god. Oh, and he's gonna destroy all the signatures and stuff. We've worked so hard for those signatures. Stop it. Jimby is also wanting to prevent Luffy from fighting Holly Jones, but Luffy's like, you ain't gonna stop me. But Jimby says, if you won't say put, you leave me no choice. I love the little nod to Ace though there. You're his little brother, all right. Oh, because yeah, Ace was headstrong. You couldn't really tell Ace what to do. He would just do it. And that's exactly what Luffy's like. So, whew. oh my God, what time is it? It's not even midnight yet. So I could probably stay up a bit longer, but boys, it's time to go to bed. That is a really cool ability that Brook has, being able to remove his soul from his body and go through like walls and stuff. So handy. Although how good is it really when he's trying to ask for help and he's just like running away. He's like, no, go away, ghost. 
<laughs> that is hilarious. It's such a good power though. Freaking loved it when Robin stood in between Jimby and Luffy and then Sanji tried to jump in to protect Robin. Robin disappears and then Luffy, Jimby and Sanji all like crash and yeah, like Robin came out of it unscathed. <laughs> Look how chill Robin is. And then boom, all that chaos. I love Robin being the sort of mediator here and really helping. She's just so calm, cool and collected. And this is the way I love Robin. It does make sense what Jinbei says because he, well, all along he's been saying, Luffy, don't fight Holly Jones. And yeah, his reasoning is quite solid. Luffy's the one who vanquished all along. And if he's the one who defeats Hardy Jones, it's like the cycle is repeating and what message does it really send to the fishmen? Can they really trust humans? Even though he would be saving Fishman Island, Holly Jones would become a martyr and stuff like that. So like, what are we supposed to do? I really do want the mermaid princess to be able to control the Neptunians and save her father, save her kingdom and be the one to do that. And also like have the Straw Hats help too. I don't want the Straw Hats to just be in the background of this entire story. Like, that's not what I read One Piece for. I want them to be proactive. But yeah, they definitely have to approach this fight so much more differently to other ones, which again is so good because we've seen a lot of the same fights before. So it'll be nice to have something a bit different. So I don't know how we're gonna approach this. Luffy is definitely resisting. He does not want to just sit back and watch it all happen. So I don't know what he's gonna do. I don't know if Jinbei is gonna be the one to take down Holly Jones or not. But it is a sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't situation for the Straw Hats right now, being humans. And we have these fishmen trying to take over Fishman Island. I'm starting to wonder if maybe Holly Jones is going to end up taking himself down. Because the steroids that he's taken, they do say that he has a shortened lifespan now whenever he takes them, but it helps him with his power. It helps dull the pain from when Zoro, you know, fought him before. So maybe Luffy and Jimbe don't even need to do anything. Maybe this whole steroid usage, which honestly sounds a little bit odd to say as a thing in One Piece, that this bad guy might be taken down by his own overuse of steroids. It's like, Okay, okay, like it's different. It's definitely different. I don't know what it's saying about that. It doesn't make Holly Jones up that powerful of four because of his over-reliance on it. But I, I don't know, I haven't really seen him really battle. He did do that little, little battle with Zoro. It wasn't that much of a battle. And he didn't exactly do amazing then either. So what we need to see now are the battles between them so that I can really get a sense of somebody's power and I don't know what's happened. Maybe the steroid usage is transforming him as well. Because they're saying the CB surround here should be under Captain Holly's control. It's the first time I've seen any of them this terrified. So is Holly Jones going to transform into something a lot more scary, a lot more terrifying because of that? This entire chapter was just chaos. A lot of stuff to do with Fishman Island, the civilians, as well as the fishermen who were trying to take over. And I think the chaotic nature of this chapter really lends in well with how chaotic this entire thing is right now. Like so much is going on and it's kind of hard to really pay attention to just one thing. And I don't know if maybe that will be a detriment to the plan of the fishermen wanting to take over. And I finally used that word correctly. I know I did. It is a detriment to their plan because of how chaotic everything feels. I just feel like without the organization, they're gonna do something to really mess up. So yeah. I don't know, but I am expecting Holly Jones to either one, take himself out, or two, transform into something way more terrifying. Okay, so Holly Jones' appearance did change. Not terrifying. He's definitely gotten more like muscular. His hair is like white now. And can someone say Daddy Jones? I'm kidding. Oh my God, I'm, I'm kidding. I am so kidding. So while he might be more powerful now, it's still not great of him, the fact that he needed these energy steroids and even his men as well, because they need to sort of, I guess, cheat, cheat in this whole thing. So hopefully they do not come out victorious. I don't think they will, but it looks like now we are getting towards the battle because we have the princes coming to the plaza and we also have Jinbei and the princess on their way too. So I think a fight is imminent. It's just... Ugh. I see it, but it's just so strange to see Holly Jones like this. He probably looks just as big as the king. Also, where is Carabao? Like, where has he been? Where is he right now? What's he doing? Is he kidnapping more mermaids? He needs to stop. He needs to be stopped. We need to find him. 
I really hope the battery lasts for this because I think this is my last chapter of the night. I'm leaving it on such a big bombshell of a chapter two that I have like one bar of battery left. So I hope it, I hope it really does see this review through. And I can't be bothered to go downstairs and get some new batteries. I've put my cats to bed. I don't want to disturb them. So firstly, actually, I haven't mentioned cover stories, but it's been fantastic because each of the cover stories has been kind of set in a different place where we've been, like in order as well from the arcs that we've had. So the next chapter is Little Garden. The cover story for this one is Whiskey Peak. And before that's like Reverse Mountain, then Logtown and so on and so forth. We've been seeing that. Isn't that Mr. Nine? Was he Vivi's partner? Like Miss Wednesday's partner? I can't remember, I think so. I think that's Miss Monday. And do they have a child together now? What? I'm glad they're doing well though, cause I like them. I did like them. They were all Baroque Works agents, but they turned out to be all right, okay? Dory and Broggy are still at it. <laughs> still fighting, hilarious. It's revealed that Hoddy Jones was the one who killed the queen and the princess knew about it all along. What? I mean, my mouth dropped when I found out about Hoddy Jones, but then it dropped even further when the princess was like, I knew. What? Yeah, I knew that. What? So they've made it seem like the humans have done it all along. I'm a little bit torn about that a little bit because like, is it making the fishmen seem like villains? Because it seems like a lot of the stuff that has happened, like say the death of the queen, as well as the now oppression of the fishmen and the taking over of the royal family and taking over Fishman Island in general, is fishmen. Like they're doing it to themselves. I guess it's kind of a way of exploring like how much hatred and anger that the humans have put in them that made them react this way. So I don't know how I feel too much about that. But yeah, it's just like bombshell after bombshell. Ah, oh, and then Madame Charlie as well. She gets shot, I think by Hoddy Jones. And also she's the sister of Arlong too. So, oh God, there was just so many like revelations. I'm trying to process this. But I was wondering where she was and I was wondering like how she would play into it. Especially since she already said, oh, Straw Hat Luffy is gonna be the one to Bring Rowan to the place. I came to tell you you're in over your head here. I looked in the future and saw that a certain man will bring Rowan to Fishman Island. Man who will destroy it, Straw Hat Luffy. He will never be the conqueror of this island. So obviously that pays him off and it's led to her being shot. So it's just getting deadly now. I need to know how people feel about this arc actually, because I don't know how I'm feeling about these revelations. I mean, it's floored me. It definitely surprised me, but like, what's it saying? What's the message here? Who are the real villains? And I won't even find out because the battery's gonna die and I need to go to bed. For continuity's sake, I'm wearing the same jumper as yesterday, but also because I have a live show later on today with Amber Elise and I bought this because of Amber Elise. So I hope that she wears it for the live show. So that will be matching. So that's the reason why I'm wearing this two days in a row, okay? Don't judge me. It really does take somebody really strong and brave to not reveal their mother's killer. And in terms of the princess, she did it because her mother's dying wish was whoever did this don't hate them. And I guess, yeah, if she had it told, although it was the shark who saw it and then relayed the information to the princess. So the fact that that happened was because they didn't want everyone to go after Hoddy Jones and kill him because then that would perpetuate the hate that's been festering and it would kind of be giving Hoddy Jones exactly what they want. So I, it's such an impossible position though because when that's your mother, honestly, it just makes me appreciate the princess even more because I can't imagine the weight of that knowledge and not doing anything about it. That is soul crushing when that's your own mother. So I feel like so bad, like so empathetic towards the princess. Ah, oh, it's it's an awful situation. Like Holly Jones is just a terrible, terrible person. It was so amazing as well to see the people of Fishman Island shouting straw hat, straw hat, even though that prophecy was still on their minds they're still shouting for Straw Hat and I love that. And then Luffy appears. And then what's even amazing as well is that Nami appears out of nowhere. Like she was able to create illusions and things back in the day. You know, I remember in Alabasta when she would, was it Alabasta? And she did this like kind of mirage thing. And she can even do like an amazing mirage thing again with her new time attacked. And it's just so awesome like to see how she's progressed in like fighting. Like I want to say an epic fight where she really showcases what she's learned over the last year. In fact, I want that for everyone. And I love the fact that they had this plan. Nami has 
the the document. Robin has the keys to release the king and then the pirate ship with Frankie and the firing is coming from the sky and it's just, oh my God, it's all epic. It's amazing to see them approach this battle differently. And then we end the chapter with this incredible, is this like the first panel of all the straw hats standing all together ready for a fight. This is the first, I'm sure this is the first one since the time skip. It just looks so good. You can decide whether we're a friend or for yourselves. And I love the fact that Luffy is giving them the option rather than just being like, oh, I'm your savior. I'm coming to help and I'm gonna save everyone. And he's not just like swooping in to be the hero. He's actually just doing good and hoping that what he's doing will resonate with the residents and letting them use their own minds and judgments to decide whether or not the offer and a fall. And I love that, I love that a lot. Did Luffy just take down 50,000 people at once? What? what? That's 50,000 people he just took down with hockey. What? Wow. What? Wow. It just, it was so easy for him. Well, we say easy for him. He did spend two years training for this. But wow, that's just incredible. And did he just use gear three without shrinking? There's only room in this world for one King of Pirates. And yep, it's Luffy, not Hottie Jones. Like, who the f do you think you are? Who do you think? Uh, he's going to the reverie so he can kill the kings. And I'm just like, Hottie Jones, don't kid yourself. You have to take supplements in order to be strong. That doesn't sound like a King of the Pirates to me. Someone shouted Van Der Decken is completely useless. And yeah, like, I feel like the villains in this arc have been not exactly useless. I feel like they have been purposeful. Well, they just haven't been up to scratch, which is a testament, isn't it, to the strength of the Straw Hats now, I think, unless I'm reading it wrong. But no, I feel like the villains in this arc have been like kind of weak. And maybe that's the point, especially since we're dealing with a theme of hatred and how that can corrupt. So like if they were strong from their hatred, I probably would have hated that. Not hated, but like I wouldn't have liked it as much if their hatred themselves made them really powerful villains. Because just hatred alone, it, which is exactly what I feel like is, what's the word? Propelling Hottie Jones forward. And just that alone, it's just not enough. Well, I, even then I don't really understand what he's fighting for too much. Like he's causing more divide and causing more pain to his own people because of the hatred he feels. Which is the point, right? That's the point. I'm trying to talk this through. But I feel like, yeah, I, I feel like, yeah, he's like the perfect embodiment of how hate can corrupt from within and the actions that you take can hurt the people around you, even if you're trying to fight for them. And even then, is he really trying to fight for them? I don't remember Arlong hurting his own crew. And this guy, he, he'll just throw them under the bus if he can. And I don't remember Arlong doing that. I believe Arlong was like a genuine pirate who cared for his crew, from what I remember. Hmm. So it'll be really interesting to reread Arlong Park now after this. <laughs> the fighting is so good. Oh my God, seeing all of the straw hats and what they've learned and it honestly feels like they're just showing off, which I bloody love. They each had something to offer and just seeing all of that and even like, cause I thought, oh, maybe Luffy will just like take everyone out and like nobody will have to do anything essentially. I'm so glad he didn't. Because even Zoro's like, hey, leave some for us. And like, they're itching for a fight. I can tell, I can tell Zoro was just like, give me an enemy, give me an enemy. And that tornado thing you did, bloody hell. Wow, look at that, that is incredible. Three sword style black rope dragon twister, it says in here, to the pits of hell. Oh my God, like that was so awesome. Oh, Zoro. <sighs> Let me tell you, you can do four swords to Tyler May, if you know what I mean. Oh my god, Brook. Brook is so flashy. He's so flashy. Look at that. To festival night and everyone's just like having a party. Do you know how incredibly funny that is? I love his fighting style. I just love how each of them have their own different fighting style and it's like really enhanced now. Even everyone's partying and they're shooting their sh shots up to the sky so it looks like fireworks. Quinto Tears Fantasia, I think it is and cuts them down. Like, Brook, you are ruthless, and I love it. I love it. Oh, Zoro got in on it, Sanji. Ugh. He has a great ability now that he can jump really high up into the air that it looks like he's flying, like he's doing like a sort of 
Skywalk thing that Robin notes, oh, that's kind of like CP9. But the fact that we had to have the flashbacks to when he ended up where he ended up during the time skip, I ran away from those hideous monsters and I'm just like, for God's sake. Yes, show us what you've learned, but... Anyway, Sanji did his thing. Robin's huge ass legs just stamping around and her just going, pardon me, it's so cute. I love it. Frankie though, Frankie though. Oh my God, have you seen what Frankie can do? Look at that, look at that. Even Luffy is watching and he's just like in awe. I'm in awe. Oh my God, he's just incredible. What is this team? The Straw Hats are like, now unstoppable. And I know I said that before. I'm sure I said that during Thriller Bulk or something. And then I instantly got my ass handed to me when I said that. But come on, come on. This is like the final evolution, surely. Sure, I mean, they still have loads to learn, I'm sure. And they will continue to adapt their fighting style. But come on, they are ready. They are ready for the new world now. Frankie becomes a tank that Chopper's driving as well. He's the commander. Oh my God. He's just incredible. And even Usopp, Usopp as well is getting in on that. Did you see my cannon shot? Like, oh my God, like, they stand no chance. They stand no chance, the fishermen anyway, like the fishermen who are against them. They, they stand no chance. And even Holly Jones brings out the Kraken and is like, fight them. And obviously Luffy and the Kraken are friends. So, <laughs> I just love the Kraken's little smile as well. So cute. Oh, this is blowing up in Holly Jones's face. Big time. See, this is what happens when you lead with hate. You go nowhere. I'm sorry, I haven't finished the chapter. What is General Frankie? What? Are you seeing this? Whoa! Iron Pirate General Frankie. Oh my god! Oh, I've got chills. <laughs> like, what can I say? Like, this is... What? He's a machine! Which is exactly the point, of course. Sorry, I'll get back to reading, but I was just like, oh my god, this is what? Okay, I've got chills. <laughs> um, oh god. Right, okay. How do I, how do I begin? How do I begin? I'm so glad that Chopper had a moment to shine in this. Nami's well, right, so one thing about Nami is that she's always been considered the weaker fighter, I guess. And I love the fact that we did have someone come up behind Nami and be like, hey, this one looks weak. And she just turns around, whips his ass. I just get scared easily. Don't underestimate whether he has weather science. So to reclaim the baton. And she absolutely just pummels him. This is what I love about Nami. She's underestimated all the time. And she always wins. Okay? She wins all the time. So I love the fact that we had that. I love Chopper's design here. Like, look at those antlers. And the fact that Chopper can turn into any other one of his forms. What were they called again? Like, changing point, horn point. Like, he had different forms that he could change using, like, a rumble ball. But now he doesn't really have to use them anymore. There's only one form I need the rumble ball for now. I can change into the other six anytime I want. Oh my god, he's like vastly improved. Oh, and I'm a cocky monster. Look at his smile, like he's not scared, he's not running away. And even Usopp is like, stand your ground, Usopp. You're not like you used to be. And then he joins in on the action as well. Oh, oh god, I almost fell off the chair. I freaking love how the Straw Hats are fine right now. They are incredible. Just incredible. Oh, anything else to know? I just love that everyone has something to do and are doing something too. This moment as well between Surumi and Luffy, when, so Hardy Jones, I think, has Surumi's siblings hostage, and that is how he's controlling the Kraken. And this moment here with Luffy talking to him, you're only obeying him to protect your brother. I know you don't want him to get hurt. Is he younger or older than you? And it's just like, Ace. It's time back to Ace. That's what I think anyway, like ugh, just seeing how Luffy is so adamant to protecting him. Like, why don't you let me protect him too? Oh God. In his next burning with rage against Hottie Jones. Oh, it's, it's beautiful, okay? It's beautiful the fact that it's like tying back to Luffy and when he wanted to protect Ace. And I think that's why he asks, is he older or younger than you? Like, to get that personability, I think, and to sort of... It's, it's a way of seeing Ace in this situation. 
and wanting to to protect these siblings that Luffy's never met, but he doesn't care. He just understands a sibling dynamic and relationship, and he knows what Suvami is doing right now because he's like hurting the princess because Holly Jones is forcing him. Luffy can definitely understand the need to protect your brother against all odds. Luffy's literally just kicked him in the face. I wouldn't be surprised if that took him out. But also, I how did I forget to mention this? I mentioned like everything else, but Noah. The, the big arc, which I guess, is this like a kind of tie to Noah's arc? You know how it was sort of, like, I'm not, I do know the Noah's arc story, of course, but like, I guess it's like purging the world and only having two of each animal. It's like, I guess, tied into the themes of Fishman Island? Maybe? I don't know. Like, maybe I'm reaching. Maybe I'm reaching. But this was Vanderdecken. This was Vanderdecken's work. It was a few chapters back, and he had touched it and he's sending it towards the princess, I believe. I believe that's what happened. And so Noah is on its way to Fishman Island, or at least like where they are, and it's massive, it's absolutely huge, and it's gonna cause so much destruction, it could destroy the island. But King Neptune said, no, we mustn't allow any harm to come to the Ark. It must never be moved until a certain day has arrived. What's that certain day? Is the certain day the day that they get to live in freedom? And is this the arc that they need to use to go to the surface and bridge the gap between like humans and fishmen? Is that the whole like two like animal thing tied into the Noah's Ark story? I don't know. I don't know. My brain is not clever enough to make all the connections. It's taken my breath away. <laughs> like this whole fight and stuff, it's taken my breath away. And I don't want to just be like positive about every single thing because I feel like that's just me with One Piece. I seem to love everything. But I also don't want to nitpick for the sake of nitpicking, you know? or the sake of being negative. So we're just gonna love this the way it is. Okay, so we have some betrayals amongst the ranks on the opposite side. And this is what happens when you have an organization within your own party. Vanderdecken's plan to take out the princess could also take everyone out. But I love the fact that the princess is, oh, it seems like she's given up her life to protect her kingdom. She is definitely her mother's child and she embodies like so much of the things that are good about people. Even Holly Jones is like, Van Der what do you think you're doing? This is betrayal. And it looks like Holly Jones is maybe going up to fight Van Der Decken himself. I don't know. This has become a little bit all over the place in terms of alliances, fighting. And that's great because, you know, war, battles aren't organized really. But the poor princess, like she really is willing to give up her life. And what an incredible, incredible person. I was really hoping that she would do something, like, to really stand up. And she can't control the Neptunians, right? So I'm like, come on, princess, you can do something. And it does look like she's doing something. So I'm really glad that she's stepping up to the plate. She's really shedding the wimpiness that Luffy keeps calling her. Which I guess is maybe, like, a parallel to when Ace and Sabo would call Luffy, like, a crybaby and stuff in the post-war arc back when they were kids. And it's just a way of making her stronger and face her fears. And this is like the biggest fear that she'll have to face. The possibility that her kingdom and her family will end. So I'm really glad that she's doing something really proactive. It's a very exciting chase getting away from the Noah and to see how those alliances now are breaking apart, especially since we end the chapter with Holly Jones stabbing Vanderdecken with a trident. That is intense. Like, yeah, what will happen if he dies? Like, will it stop? Oh, hang on. We don't want that to happen because it's going vertically. It's going straight up from Fishman Island. So if he just dies, will the Noah just like fall? Uh, crap. Actually, I didn't think about that until I started talking about it. Well, we don't want that to happen right now. I mean, I, I want Van Der to die, like, which sounds extreme, but I kind of do. But I don't want the Noah to crush that. Okay, that's more exciting than I realized. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing, I would love to say this animated. I would love to say this like in the anime form because there is so much going on. There's so much chasing happening. So many different people going after different people and different fights happening as well. And I, I do really like that. Especially since we haven't had a fight under the sea before. So it's just really exciting and interesting to watch. This is the part of the video where I probably don't have a whole lot to say about the chapters because there is a lot of fighting going on. But I was right about Deccan. If he gets killed, then yeah, the effects will wear off and the ship will go straight back down. And that's exactly what's happened. Holly Jones has 
taken him out, I believe. I can't tell if the ship is going back down or not just yet because a lot is going on on these pages. It probably has slowed down, so it will probably end up crashing down. So we have that added element of tension and stakes in this. So it's, oh my God, it's gonna be really scary. Loving the fights that are underwater though. And I love the fact that we have Jimbe and Sanji teaming up. And then we also have Zoro, who is just itching for a fight. He might be a good warm up before we head into the new world. And I just think that the fights will not last that long. I do believe that our Straw Hats and our main characters are just like so powerful now that it won't even matter who's against who. They're gonna, they're gonna beat them. I do like the fact that the Straw Hats are learning from their past experiences, like say Alabasta. And it was even mentioned about the whole digging holes thing because I remember that one Baroque Works member who was so annoying, but she was the mole, the mole-like person. And I just remember her shouting constantly. I was just like, oh, put a sock in it. But Chopper connected like the holes and stuff and they used their past experience to win the fight, essentially. There are a lot of fights going on though at the same time. Again, not much that I can possibly say about it. Vanderdecken is still alive, but the nowhere seems to, like it's gonna go down. However, Vanderdecken did say that he has Holly Jones's imprint on his like left hand. So now he can send anything to him. So if he can send the Noah to Hardy Jones, then hopefully that would stop it, right? I don't know if he will do that. I don't know if he can do that. Can he do that? I'm sure he can. He did it for the princess. You're my left hand talking now, buddy boy. Actually, he might not be able to do that because he does seem to pass out. Like you regain consciousness for a second, then I think he's passed back out again. But just seeing the scope of how big this ship is and the way that it seems like it's gonna go back down, Noah is falling. It is scary. It's very scary, especially since everyone that we know and love is on Fishman Island right now. It's funny that Brooke accidentally kind of saved Nami from this thing, his spear, and he's asking in the middle of all of this, hey, can I see your panties? Brooke, come on. But I love the fact that Nami actually hits Brooke absolutely not. Like, even during all of this, she still is just like, no, absolutely not, slaps him. And when Brooke turns around, I'm already a shriveled husk. <laughs> so funny, so good. I do wonder what the humans have done to Holly Jones to warrant all of this anger and hatred that he would wipe out his own people, wipe out his own home in order to exact that vengeance. But then like, what's that actually gonna do to humankind? How is wiping out his own people gonna help anything? So the princess's brother has mentioned that he knows Holly Jones's true nature because Holly Jones has told him, what in the world happened to you in the past? What did the humans do to you? Uh, and now I'm like intrigued. Like, is there a really good explanation as to why he would kill his own people? He's just hurting the people he is vowing to be doing this for. And honestly, that is a really great theme. Like that's a really great thing to explore. Like for instance, I watched the Boston Marathon bombing Netflix documentary last night with my patrons during True Crime and White Night and about how there was so much Islamophobia after 9-11 and like a lot of people were wrongly judged for what happened and when one person does something bad the entire group is sort of vilified for it. So is that what we're like kind of exploring right now? Like the fact that we have this one fishman because now I feel like nobody is really on Holly Jones' side right now. I think he's gone too far. He's gone way too far. And now no one's really on his side, even his own men, I think. I mean, they're still fighting on the ground, but that's because they are fighting for their lives. But when it comes to Holly Jones and his plan and him allowing the Noah to, you know, go down on Fishman Island and stuff, it's like his own hatred and his own anger is what is going to destroy his own people. And they don't want that. They do not want that. I don't know if I'm thinking way too much into it. I don't know if it's actually that deep, but it's just so interesting to, and I'm sure I've said interesting so many times in this, but it's just like, it's it's making my brain work. I do hope that we find out in the next chapter what it is that has driven Holly Jones to do this, if anything at all. The way that Zoro and Chopper are just chatting during this fight and stuff. I, I love it. Zoro's like, hey, your humanoid form is looking pretty monstrous these days. And Chopper's like, I'm fine being a monster for Luffy's sake. And Zoro's like, gotcha. And I'm just like, the fact that they're just like having this banter during these fights is just so great. Cause again, it really does show the connection between the Straw Hats, how 
great they are. I just love them. Zoro is looking for an actual challenge, <laughs> which of course he is. And what I'm worried about the new world is that Zoro might be too strong for them. I mean, probably not. But he will be continuously looking for challenges and throwing himself into the heat of battle. I also love Robin's sunglasses as well. She looks so cool. Is this a new thing for Robin? I think it is. I don't think I've seen her with like sunglasses on before. Have I? Okay, ignore me if I'm wrong. Please just ignore me if I'm wrong because fake fan if I am. But yeah, a lot of the new Fishman Pirates are kind of hurting their own people. It's such a bad thing for them to do. It's like, what are your actual morals in doing this? Are you just looking to hurt people rather than actually trying to make change and make progress? Because that's exactly what we had the Queen trying to do was make progress, make change. And it seems like they want things to stay the same, but they just want to fight. It's like this whole reverie thing would be able to change Fishman and the ability to be free and away from all of the slavery that's been enforced on them too. But it's like they want things to be the same. They just want to fight back and just cause more harm. That's what it seems like the new pirates are doing at the minute. So there's a lot of thinking involved with this arc. Oof, he just hates. He's a product of his environment. And isn't that exactly what the queen was fighting for back when she was alive? And she was like, not in front of the kids. You know, like she was really adamant about the next generation not seeing, or at least not holding the hatred that had been sort of passed down through the generations towards humans. So the new Fisherman Pirates live in fear of their ancestors' hatred being forgotten, live in the hope that their holy war is just that, the humans are all evil. They desire blood, they do not even want peace for Fisherman Island. What did the humans do to you? Nothing. Hardy is entirely empty, there is no substance within him. But like, doesn't hatred not have substance? <sighs> like this is, <laughs> again, like, deeper than I could have ever imagined. There is a lot of hatred that can be justified, absolutely. But it seems like the hatred that is born within Holly Jones was just something that was handed down to him. It isn't from experience and will. He's just empty. This is the product of what hatred can do. Especially, like, can you imagine if, like, Holly Jones had grown up without this hatred? Could you imagine if he didn't have those beliefs from his ancestors that all humans are evil? Can you imagine how different he would have become? He could have been a huge asset rather than a detriment to Fishman Island. Hatred has no place in this world. And this is what Hardy Jones is embodying. I think he hates to hate. He isn't doing anything to help his own people. His vengeance, his vendetta is doing nothing but destroy. This is what hatred does. It destroys from within. And Holly Jones is already empty. He's a shell. He has no substance. And yet his influence in what he's doing is corrupting his entire country, his entire people. And we're trying to protect the children, like say, going back to the flashbacks, we're trying to protect the children from doing this. This is what they have to prevent. This is what we need to do to fight for change for the future by making sure that, well, one, the kids don't see the the festering hatred and also be inspired by it and grow up with it. Because no kid is born with hate. No kid is born to hate someone else. It's taught. It's from seeing other people do it. That's why we have people growing up to be these awful, awful people in the real world as well. And I feel like that's, is that, is that the point of Fishman Island? Is that the point that we're getting to here? There is no place in this world for hatred. So therefore, there is no place in this world for Hardy Jones. In other news, I loved seeing Brooke fighting and realising that he's part of the world with his soul and stuff. And yeah, I, I can't explain it, but I just, I was watching it happen and being like, yeah, yeah, that looks awesome. That looks awesome. Robin can clone herself now as well, I think. There was like two of her. Like, that's so awesome. Way beyond what my imagination took her powers too. It blows my mind. I can't explain that either, but I just love seeing it happen. And Usopp as well is also flexing his new powers and his skill on the battlefield. So it was a really good chapter actually, like really, really, really good. And especially since we find out the true intentions of Holly Jones is that he is nothing. He is nothing. Oh, it has just started pouring down with rain. Wow. It's really heavy. I love it though. Luffy's just dealt a devastating blow on Holly Jones. So I don't know if he's knocked out or what. But they did promise that they're not going to hurt anyone on Fishman Island. Especially since we got like a flashback to Holly Jones 
younger and he just hates the the stories that Hatchie was telling about like humans actually doing good things. He just didn't want to hear any of it. He just wanted to go away. He hated Fishman who sympathized or helped humans. And honestly, that is just a genuine reflection on our world, like on the real world, on society. It's honestly like this arc itself is way deeper than I ever imagined. And considering that we are deep in the ocean, kind of fitting, honestly. The parallels between how deep the themes run and how deep the scars of humanity run correlates with how deep in the ocean we are right now in the story. It's like, yeah, the, the sins of our past, the sins of the ancestors that we have run so deep and the people who are suffering the most are the ones who have been oppressed to stay there, you know, stay so low down that they can't just leave, they can't be free. And Holly Jones is representing the internal hatred and the corruption of that and not even wanting the change and how he's affecting his own people and keeping them also oppressed. But hopefully that was like the end of Holly Jones, fingers crossed. Hey, Chopper can control his monster form. Incredible. He really has come a long way. I'm so proud of him. I'm proud of all of Master o Hats, really. I love the fact that Brooke is the one who gave the speech about even after death, all you leave behind is bones, not hatred. In hatred, you don't need to carry that with you to the grave. It just, oh God, it was so much more impactful, the fact that it came from a skeleton. A skeleton. And even then, us humans, in all the discrimination that so many people have faced, it's just, for what? For what, at the end of the day, we're all just bones. We're the same. We're the same underneath. Like, why, why all the judgment? Why all the harassment? Why all the discrimination, you know? Honestly, there are a lot of scumbags out there. And as we've seen, especially with the portrayal of Holly Jones and the new Fisherman Pirates and what they have and what they retain hatred-wise, it's just so incredible to see. And then, is it Charlie? A lot of the Fishermen are still there and they're not running away. They're standing strong. And yeah, I think it's Madame Charlie. And she is talking to one of the children. She's like, you must witness what is about to happen with clear, honest eyes, free from preconception. Use your own judgments. Don't allow other people's hatred to infect you. You see what is happening before your eyes. And without any preconceptions, this is what is happening. And again, that's just like such a beautiful moral. Such a beautiful moral to everything that Fishman Island is trying to represent. And I think it's been doing a really good job at that. But I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but this is just like my interpretation of it. I just take so much from what is happening in this arc. And I'm trying not to let my own trauma of being treated differently make me see this in a different way. I don't think my own experiences have clouded my judgment on this. I don't think I'm enforcing my own experiences on this myself due to like being part of the LGBTQ plus community, for example. I think order is hitting so many valid points about racism. And he has been doing this for a, a couple of times now, actually. He is really showing us the bad side of the hatred that we have from our ancestors to do with like racism and anything like that. I love the fact that we just do not have a single weak link in the Straw Hats now. Usually when we do have these big battles in these arcs, there might be one or two Straw Hats who are maybe running away or like hiding. They can't use their skills in that specific fight, for instance. But every single person had a part to play in the fight of Fishman Island. Like they each did something incredible. One thing I will say, <laughs> I didn't want to, I didn't want to, but with Sanji, he's kind of, he, he brings up his terrible two years again. And he has this hatred for them, for, for the women that he faced on that island. He has a hatred that we have just spent an entire arc showing how silly having this hatred inside of you is and how hollow it can make you. I think we all know the reason why Sanji hates the women on that island that he ended up on. Because in his mind, they aren't real women. They aren't the women that he wants to perv on, essentially. I mean, I might be overreaching there. But after everything we've just learned in Fishman Island and Sanji is again bringing up his terrible two years, bringing up his hatred, using that hatred and whatever he's learned on the island to make himself turn into flames. While it is cool that he's all up in flames and stuff, I just feel like he is undermining 
a lot of the messages that we've learned in this arc. I mean, maybe I'm just overreading that. Maybe I'm just enforcing again my own opinion on that. But it does feel a little bit like undermining what we've just learned with this apparent hatred that Sanji keeps bringing up. And yeah, I, I need to know exactly what happened on that island now because I, I just need to understand Sanji more, I think. I just need to understand where he's coming from. But honestly, a part of me just doesn't really want to know the answer because if he explicitly states what he is thinking and what he thinks of his time on that island for whatever reason, we may not be able to come back from that. And I, I, I don't want that to happen. But yeah, plot-wise, just a lot of fighting. It was really good. And I finished volume 65. So now I am on volume 66. Oh, yay, Fishman Island has been saved. And I'm glad that it was the princess who managed to call the Neptunians, even though it does seem like she did it, well, subconsciously, more than intentionally. She wanted to save the kingdom. She wanted to lend Luffy her strength. And the Neptunians came and stop the ship from, well, one, getting damaged by Luffy because he was trying to destroy it, and two, to stop it from landing on Fishman Island. That was so good. Like, that was such a good fight. Well, I say fight, like, the whole stakes of it, like, from the start of the fighting to, to now, it's been so exciting to watch unfold. So good. So, so good. Not a whole lot else to say, just that I am actually really glad that it was the princess who managed to do something to save her people. And while, yes, it happened because Luffy was able to demonstrate so much strength to her as well. It's kind of like a joint thing. I'm still glad she had a bit of a proactive approach. Even though she did just cry and pray, it still helped. It still helped. So I love that. And also the fact that we have the Neptunians commenting on Luffy. My, my, what a human he is. What a mighty little man. Like, is this going to be the start of something new? Is this going to be the start of maybe Luffy also being able to control like some Neptunians later on? Maybe. I don't know. Because he did manage to tame the Kraken. And the Kraken was this big creature. Like, is there any reason why he can't with the Neptunians? I don't know. Like, I would need to read more, of course. I guess the theory of mine now is that maybe Luffy will be able to control. Like, I don't think he would control, like, in a bad way. But, like, be able to be in harmony, I guess, with the Neptunians, maybe, in the future. Especially since they've now seen his strength and power too and what he wants to do for this island that he could have just left at any time. He didn't have to help. And as he says himself, he's not a hero because he wants to eat all the meat. But the way other people see him is so powerful in itself that now that the Neptunians have seen him here, maybe that will work into something later on. Maybe. Maybe. Oh, I've got the biggest smile on my face right now. I just know that the Queen will be looking down with happiness at what's just happened in Fishman Island and the steps we're taking for progress and change. The fact that Luffy needed a blood transfusion and none of the other Straw Hats had the same blood type. It was so touching, actually, that there were some random fishmen who even said, I'm type F, I'm F. They are saying like, oh, we have the same blood type. But there is that law that fishmen can't give blood to humans in Fishman Island. And they have changed it now. Jim Bay has offered to give his blood because he has the same blood type, which is amazing, honestly. And again, it just shows you that at the end of the day, our blood's the same, our bones are the same. Yeah, it was just like a really good chapter. And it just made me smile so much just to see the progress here and yeah the chapter is called road to the sun and it really is like this is one of the big huge steps to get into a better future and oh, it's just so good i just love the fact that we had people willing to help even though it was against the law and the king is like hey the old laws are a curse yeah exactly we need change but oh my god the neptunians what? So they even said, was it my imagination? That human with a hat seemed to notice our voices. That can't be. It's happened once before. Goldie Roger. Goldie Roger. That is Goldie Roger, isn't it? I think so, yes. What? So I, I thought, like, even in the previous chapter when I was like, oh, maybe Luffy will be able to, like, control them or at least, like, be in harmony with them. Maybe just, like, understand them. Like, and yeah, like, literally, they even are questioning, could he hear our voices? This, this has only happened one other time with a human. And it seems like it was Goldie Roger. Oh my God, like honestly, the more and more we read of One Piece, the more and more it's becoming likely that Luffy is the one to be King of the Pirates. It has to happen. 
Oh my god. The road toward the sun, yes. Oh. I'm just so happy. Wait, what? The princess is the weapon. Her name is Poseidon. What? <laughs> so, Shirahoshi, the ancient weapon Poseidon? What? And I love the fact that Robin is, well, because Robin is probably the only character who's progressing the wider plot of, you know, a lot of the history and stuff. And I, it was some stuff that I'm really intrigued by, like that whole hundred year void, everything to do with the polyglyphs, I am so intrigued by. So I love it when we have moments like this with Robin, where we find out more. And she ties it back to the polyglyph she found in the Sky Island and the location of the ancient weapon being in Fishman Island. And that ancient weapon is the princess? It, who's called Poseidon? What? They're protecting Noah through the generations until the day the promise comes about that Noah will fulfill its actual purpose. So like, what is the purpose? And I think maybe the only person who can control the Neptunians is the princess. So I, I said about Luffy maybe being able to, maybe he won't be able to actually control them actually, but will be able to understand them. Maybe. Just blow my mind why don't you? I wasn't expecting that. Also, I got major Little Mermaid under the sea vibes from <laughs> this panel. I do hope that Jimbei does join them eventually. He can't join them just yet. He still has duties and things to do. But everyone's on board with him joining. I'm on board with him joining. I would love for Jimbei to be part of it. I love him. He's done so much for us. And he was close with Ace. So, you know, I love him for that too. For Poseidon! I just can't get over that. I cannot get over Poseidon, ancient weapon, the princess. Oh, I just, I'm, I'm flawed. And the next chapter is chapter 650, which is another really great milestone I'm flying through. Mm, so is Big Mom a bad person? I mean, I know she was being the protector of Fishman Island, like taking over from Whitebeard in exchange for them giving her sweets, which is, it, it's odd. It is a request, an odd request, and they don't have any sweets to give her this time, which kind of reminds me a little bit of, you know, A Bug's Life, <laughs> when they have to get all of the things for, I think it's the grasshoppers, like all the ants have to get the stuff for the grasshoppers, and they can't meet the quota. It kind of reminds me a little bit of that. I don't know, that sounds random to me. So yeah, now are we going to have to deal with Big Mom? I mean, her name is interesting, so I do look forward to meeting her. We learned so much about what happened after the Paramount War, Summit War, whatever you want to call it. We found out that... Okiji and Aka Ainu were fighting for 10 days? 10 days? And ugh, oh, the scumbag who killed Ace, I hate him so much, emerged victorious and now Sakazuki, I guess is his name as the Admiral of the Navy. The new fleet Admiral of the Navy is his title. Ugh, oh, I hate him. I hate him so much. Okiji is not dead, but he has left the Navy. So he could pop up anywhere, really. He could be an ally, potentially. Oh, there's nothing worse than freaking Sakazuki Akainu being the, the one in charge of the Fleet Admiral of the Navy. Oh, I want him to die. I do. I want him to die so badly. Oh, Blackbeard pirates have gotten control of a whole stretch of sea as well and has become Emperor. So he is Emperor alongside Red Hair Shanks, Kaido and Big Mom. So they're the four emperors now, okay, okay. I feel like the only person who is an emperor who seems to be a good guy is Shanks. Like, what is wrong with the other ones? And I was wondering what the hell happened to Carabao. So has he overheard what Robin heard from the king about the princess being Poseidon? So now he knows, right? Like he overheard that. And he does try and kidnap her, but Luffy stops him and he gets blasted away. But he knows, right? He knows about her being the ultimate or the ancient weapon even. Like he knows. Not only that, but he does have all of the kingdom's treasure and obviously Nami wants it. He's just been a big pain in the ass in this arc. So he will probably most likely come back a bigger and stronger villain. But at the minute, he was just like a big pain in the ass. I do hope Fishman Island can just rest now and Big Mom isn't gonna plan some kind of attack. Because come on, we, we don't have the time or the energy right now. Oh, look at Luffy declaring war on Big Mom and declaring that Fishman Island will be his territory. I would much rather Luffy be the one like to kind of replace Big Mom as like the white beard figure for Fishman Island. That would be really cool. But Big Mom is kind of terrifying. I was hoping she would be some kind of ally. But no, she is very intent on getting these sweets. 
I just love the fact that Luffy like picked up the phone. He's just like, hello. Yeah, I ate all 10 turns of your sweets. <laughs> it's so funny, but it's so Luffy. It's almost like when he declared war on the world government. You know, it's like he's declaring war on Big Mom, who is apparently at Whole Cake Island, which I know is an upcoming arc. So I'm really excited to get there because it looks so cool. I kind of like the look of it. It looks different. It looks very different. It looks like, well, a whole cake. <laughs> Essentially, it's an island that looks like a cake. Of course. And I don't know why, but Big Mom just makes me think of like Studio Ghibli maybe, or like some kind of spirited away villain. I don't know, like she seems, she seems odd. I can't wait to know more about her. What I've loved about the end of this arc is it's making me so intrigued for the next, which is what a lot of the arcs end up doing for me. They just make me so excited to continue reading. It's just so good. I love it. I love it. Like, oh God, like I just love it. Uh, also they did stop Carabao and they got the treasure off him, but then they just walked away and he was like KO'd on the ground. But like, is he gonna get up and leave? Like what? Like they should imprison him. Obviously they don't know that he's overheard anything, but yeah, he was about to kidnap the princess. So like, he needs to face the consequences of his actions. Also Hardy Jones and his men have been aged up. Like they've been severely aged up. I think it was because of the drugs or the, the treasure that was in the box that Hardy Jones stole 10 years before. So that is also interesting. He's become an old man with only hatred in his heart. I can't think of a worse fate. Uh, so the reason why Jimbei wouldn't join the Straw Hat straight away is because he has ties to Big Mom because of the protection that she is putting on Fishman Island. Or he's like allowing them to use her name because of the whole sweet thing. I don't know. Anyway, so yeah, he just wanted to see how he would be able to cut ties with Big Mom so that he could join the Straw Hats. But now like, do we have to worry about cutting ties with Big Mom because after what Luffy did on the phone, but also not just that, but one of the treasures has a bomb in it. And they've just given it to Big Mom. They've given all the treasure to Big Mom. Yeah, that's going to be like a, a an act of war against her, right? Oh God, like seriously. <laughs> they haven't even gotten to Whole Cake Island yet. And they're already wanted criminals there, essentially. Which is hilarious. And Nami as well. She's like, you had to give all of the treasure away. And like the way she just beats up Zoro, Sanji and Luffy just... Oh. I'm glad we have this humour back again. I've missed the Straw Hats having their dynamic together. And now we are seeing it again in like Nami, the way that she beats them up like so easily. <laughs> Carabao is just annoying at this point, I think. Like he seems to be a bit of a buggy tryhard because like I'm getting sort of flashbacks to Buggy in the way that he would do things, but not in the same way as Carabao, but just like the way that they sort of fail in a lot of things, like it seems almost comedic. So I don't know if maybe he's just a, a buggy tryhard. I don't know in the future, maybe I will end up liking Carabao, especially since now that I like buggy, it just took me a while to get there. So maybe he does redeem himself, especially if Murphy really likes him now. I just have to like wait it out. I can't reserve too much judgment on him just yet. But he does seem to be a little bit farcical. Yeah, I, I, I just don't really care that much for him right now. He does still scare me the way he looks, but then again, so did buggy. Because again, I'm kind of scared of clowns. So yeah, it's just an interesting one, interesting one. But anyway, we're going on to the last chapter now. It's time for the new world. Oh my God. Oh. The end of this chapter has me imbued with so much hope about the future right now. Like we're in the new world. Finally, we're at the new world. <laughs> oh God. Like I've been waiting for this moment since I knew there was a new world. <laughs> the whole geography of the new world as well is absolutely fascinating, especially since we know that the old log pauses just won't work in this place. And having the one with like the three needles instead and the one that shakes the most means that there's danger ahead. And like you can kind of pick three paths you kind of have to use your instinct as well, which also gives more autonomy to Nami's navigator. Although Luffy overheard about the one that shakes the most is like the most dangerous. And obviously Luffy will want to go to the most dangerous one. And Nami's like, no, you told him. And she's just like, oh. But I'm so glad we have more options now about where we go and the places that we can visit, the things that we can see in this new world. Oh my gosh, I'm just so excited to get there and to see all the incredible things that Order has laid out for me, for us. Oh, this adventure is just so incredible. The ending also reminded me a bit of Alabaster as well, because they promised the princess that they will reunite, they will be able to take her on an adventure, go for another stroll. And yeah, they all promised this to her and it's just so beautiful and it reminded me of that Alabaster moment. 
And it was just so wonderful, like a wonderful way to end this arc, to start our new adventure again in the new world. And ah, it was just wonderful and magical and just so good. I really enjoyed it. And I also love the fact that so many people in Fishman Island want a straw hat. Like they want a hero hat. They want to feel like a hero as well. I want to grab mine. Although I do need a new one, one that actually fits me. But... <laughs> yeah, this hat is just too small for me. I need a new one. But I also wanted a hero hat. I want to be a straw hat so bad. But I also love the fact that we did have one of the... I think it was a parent, maybe? Because they're saying, Daddy, Daddy, buy me a straw hat. I want to play heroes. And they're saying, go up there and get one. And he's like, don't be silly. There are all kinds of terrible humans up there who hate our kids. And, and then he kind of remembers what we've learned this entire arc about passing on the fear and the hatred to our children. And he says, well, only a few of them are. And some of them are good, strong folks like Luffy. And it's just like, this is the start of the change. This is the road to the sun, you know? It's just, <laughs> I love the way that came back around. And Luffy is now even more determined to reunite with Shanks too. And he's like, we'll be on the same stage as Shanks. And we see little flashbacks there to Shanks saying, promise me that you'll give it back to me someday when you become a great pirate. And Ace as well, I know you can do it. You're my little brother. <sighs> Try to remember what you still have from Jimbe. Really seeing go all the way at the top. Kobe, the end of the ocean is a place they call the New World. Luffy declaring he will become King of the Pirates. And now we are in the New World. It's it's actually happening. It's happening. It's happening right now. Oh my God. So all in all, I really enjoyed the Fishman Island arc. I thought it was fantastic. I need to see other people's reviews on it. I don't know the general census on this, but I think it did explore the themes that Oda wanted it to explore quite well. I loved the fact that Holly Jones turned out to be such a hollow and shallow villain, essentially. And it really does enhance that idea that hatred is corrupting and self-destructive. And the, really the only people you're hurting when you're doing all of the things that Hardy Jones was doing is himself and the people he's supposed to be protecting, the people he's supposed to be fighting justice for. But he doesn't want justice, he just wanted bloodshed. So I love the fact that we had all of that. I, I don't know what to rate it. I don't know what to rate this arc. It's it's hard because I, I don't think it's one of my favourite favourites. I do think I still prefer, maybe this is like the same as Thriller Bark, where we had it following arcs that were fantastic because it had just come after the Ennius Lobby arc. So maybe it was the placement of this is just like, not at, because we have just had the Paramount Wall, we just had the Summit Wall, whatever it's called. We had that, we just had that. So anything that really immediately comes after that isn't gonna be as epic. And that's fine, it doesn't have to be. I think this was like the perfect introduction into the new world. And I just enjoyed so much of it. Yeah, I think maybe an 8.5. I know you're probably thinking like, oh my God, 0.5, why? That puts it on par with Drum Island. And I love Drum Island. So yeah, I think that's probably, probably right. And it's definitely above Return to Sabody because that got a seven. And you know, there was just like so much to love, so much to love about this. And I, I don't really think I have very many criticisms about it. I don't think I do. I have to spend however many long talking about this arc, so yeah, I, I don't think I have anything else left to say other than it was just like a really good arc to me personally, and I enjoyed it a lot. So next we have the Punk Hazard arc, so that is what I will be reading next. I do still have my One Piece channel membership. I have exclusive live shows on there, early access to videos if you are interested, link in the description. And I've read this in perfect time because I still have a few hours before a live show tonight on Amber Elise's channel to talk about why we love One Piece. So I will leave a link to that live show in the description box if you wanna check it out. But yeah, that is the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate it. Don't forget to leave this video a like if you enjoyed it and subscribe if you haven't already. Leave all your comments down below, let me know what you thought of the Fishman Island dog. What did you think of my thoughts? Did you disagree with anything I said? Agree with anything I said? Let me know everything down below and if I mentioned something wrong or interpreted something wrong I always appreciate the correction so please go wild go wild in the comments I want to give a huge thank you to my patrons and my One Piece channel members if you'd like to join my Patreon or my One Piece channel membership then all the links are down in the description box but yeah I hope I will see you in the next video bye